That's why we're All right, we have a quorum present. I would like to call today's Community Redevelopment Agency meeting to order. At this time, it is necessary for me to ask all CRA board members if they have any ownership involvement within the CRA in property ownership, uh, and that includes um, renting. I'll start with Councilwoman DeWeese. No, sir. No. All right. Councilman Wu. I do. Negative. I'm a resident of the CRA. Right. I, too, am a resident and uh, a property owner. All right. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is the approval of the July 16th, 2012 CRA board meeting minutes, as was distributed for your review. Move the approval. Second. All right. I have a motion and a second for approval. All those in favor? Aye. Please indicate by saying aye. Oh, aye. Aye. All right. That passes unanimously. Next on the agenda, we have two discussion items. The first being the Downtown Technology Park, our interlo interlocal agreement. We have a representative from the Chamber of Commerce, as well as our administrator, Ryan Winterberg Lipp, who can provide us some background and um, equally important, um, certainly I recognize there's a um, limited amount of time, but uh, an update regarding any recent activity. Ryan, if you will please. Thank you, begin. Chairman, board members. Uh, from Councilwoman DeWeese's request at last month's CRA budget hearing, I've provided a brief outline of the downtown tech park interlocal um, and some of the CRA's potential liabilities contained within. And Scott Luth from the chamber is here uh, to answer any specific questions. And he does have another time commitment. Um, so I just want to provide a very brief outline before we uh, turn it over to him. Uh, so briefly, the CRA is responsible for any gap in the reimbursement of the county's $2.5 million infrastructure investment uh, left over from the Economic Development Administration grant. That difference would be paid from the TIF revenues accrued from the sale of the Tech Park properties. Again, um, also the CRA is also responsible for the difference between the 2007 appraised value of the Tech Park lots and the actual sale price that would be realized today. And the entire Tech Park appraised for 8.3 sorry, 8 0.325 million uh, back in 2007, again, at the height of the market, um, and I don't believe that any of the lots have sold today, uh, so that liability is currently unknown. And uh, these CRA commitments are, of course, subordinate to the uh, demolition of the ECUA wastewater treatment plant and the bonds for the Community Maritime Park, so uh, those would take precedence. And if there are any specific questions, um, I'd like to turn it over to Scott, since I know he does have to leave in about five or so minutes. <laughs> Certainly, I want to thank the opportunity to come before the council and uh, answer any questions that uh, that you may have in regards to the uh, technology park itself. Uh, one thing I can report is, uh, are you looking for a report? Yeah, and Scott, if you don't mind, just for those that may be attending for the first time to, to hear just a little bit, um, maybe they're being introduced to the downtown technology park for the first time. Um, I, I know that there's not a day that you don't wake up that you're not thinking about how that it can be basically integrated into our business community, but, um, and I apologize that I do not have any sort of visuals for people, so um, go ahead and even remind or inform people of where this property is, the exact size combined when, with both the county parcel and the city parcel, and then take it from there. Okay, great. I, I will kind of step back and just give you just a brief overview again. The uh, downtown, downtown uh, technology park is the uh, approximately, um, approximately nine acres located just south of the Civic Center. Uh, the park itself was, I think, originally designed or uh, put together in, in approximately 2007, uh, to th somewhere between 2007 2009. Uh, it was a concept of a partnership between the city, the county, and also the uh, PEDC, the um, primary development authority that uh, the Chamber of Commerce works with, uh, put together a concept to basically develop a piece of property in the downtown community to help uh, recruit uh, higher technology-based companies to the area. Uh, 
the little history on that is, is, uh, is, is I am aware, like I said, I've uh, been working on this project for about a year now, while it has a, a much longer history than my tenure here in the community, uh, was originally set up under uh, two companies that, uh, that had an interest in building and locating in the park uh, for a, maybe a number of reasons. Those projects didn't go all the way through to completion. Uh, but what we do have left, again, is uh, approximately nine acres of, uh, of property uh, located within the city limits that are out there and available for companies to consider uh, building cl nice Class A office space. And so from an advantage from the community perspective, it's something that a lot of communities uh, are, are envious of and wish that they did have. So there's a, definitely there's an asset out there for us to, uh, to begin to market and to, to, uh, to bring projects and companies to this area. Uh, we actually had EDA in town this morning. Uh, we were going through our final closeout on the park. Uh, some folks, even though the infrastructure's been out there and we've done quite a bit of work, the actual closeout on the park really will occur in the next week or so uh, once we submit the final documentation to EDA. Uh, this was really my first chance to speak with EDA and get an, an idea of what their expectations were and what are some of our commitments are for the EDA funding. Uh, just, uh, just to move forward, <clears throat> what we're looking at right now is uh, it's construction cost on the uh, on the park itself, and this is just the hard infrastructure cost. We're probably looking at somewhere around 2.4 million is what the uh, project itself is going to cost. Now, on top of that, there were other other items that actually went into the development of that, uh, as well as your engineering uh, infrastructure. There were some decisions that were made to really make the park a lot nicer and and a lot higher end than uh, and to be comparable with a lot of other parks that you see within the region and in the south. Uh, we're, we're looking at somewhere probably an overall cost of the park of somewhere around three million dollars when you look at all inclusive uh, total numbers in and again these are approximate right now but we're going through our final numbers and we'll have something uh, for the council for us to report on once we uh, once we finalize those uh, the EDA grant was uh, basically a reimbursable only for those hard infrastructure costs and actually it was based on a reimbursement amount from EDA of uh, just over 53 percent so there was always a intention that we would would have a local match tied with this project so for every dollar that we put or every dollar of the project costs EDA would only pick up about 53 percent of that to date what we're looking at is an approximately approximate debt on the construction of the park of uh, just shy of two million dollars and that's after the EDA money has been spent and that's after all of the other matching dollars have been put in uh, we're estimating a uh, debt at the county of being about 1.9 million. And if, I think that was one of the questions that you all had is what was your p potential liability of the cost of the, to build the park and it'll be just shy of 2 million. And we are participating as uh, uh, obligated in that $2 million debt. That's my understanding just, the way the interlocal agreement is written to date, correct. Uh, the other items that go into the park and uh, uh, Ryan mentioned this briefly and that was the value of the property. And uh, she is correct. You're looking about uh, 8.3, a little over 8.3 million dollars of value, and that was a market rate of 2007, I believe, when the project was 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 put together. Uh, what we're looking at now is, as we begin to try to price lots, you know, for companies to come in or people to build on, is is obviously is what at what cost or what price can we actually sell the lots for? Uh, one of the constraints that we have is we're obviously dealing with a market value of property that was established at the height of the market, you know, as compared to what property value is right now. Uh, one of the things that we are going to have to look at is coming back to the council as well as to the county to look at a revised interlocal agreement because the price of the property is actually written into the agreement without any uh, concessions for today's market value of that property. So that's one of the items that we are going to have to readdress and relook at if we're going to be uh, able to competitively market this property for a potential investor to come in. Um, that's kind of where we see it to date, and those are some of the things that we'll be putting together probably over the next 30 days or so is uh, you know, what those numbers look like and trying to come up with our local agreement that allows us to uh, basically be uh, more competitive in trying to recruit companies into this community, into this area. I want to remind all um, fellow CRA members that the reason we've got this as a discussion item, certainly it was requested by, um, by one of our members, and also, I mean, we as a CRA are an obligor of this as a, um, as a member or a party to a binding agreement. We are, we are legally obligated to, to meet 
some, again, funding obligations as the, as the obligor. And what I hope that we can um, determine, and I'm going to ask a few questions um, right now, is, um, again, are we obligated based on a, the previous valuation at the height of the market? And are you suggesting that is there, as you understand, any opportunity for that legal agreement to have any modification as it relates to the valuation of the property? Um, again, is the, the best that I understand the way the local agreement is, uh, that is correct. That's the way it is written. Uh, in my discussions with, uh, with EDA uh, this morning, um, they would also have to agree to any amendments to the uh, interlocal agreement because that was used as part of their funding criteria. Uh, but uh, at this time, there would definitely be a willingness and, you know, and an understanding that, uh, that those, that value of that property needs to be uh, reconsidered, you know, uh, so many years later as compared to when it was originally put together. And the previous, previously recorded value is 8.3. Uh, combined, that's correct. 8.3 million for this uh, approximate nine acre parcel. And I haven't pulled out my iPhone to quickly check on a, on a per square foot basis, but uh, do you have any of that? Uh, I do not have that uh, right now. I, I did run just a calculation on the overall project cost, uh, just, just a rough number, and we were well over $50 a square foot. For undeveloped but infrastructure in place. Correct. Property. Correct. And I think it's um, appropriate. Um, I, I will share, based on my limited knowledge of, of real estate, um, that is a tremendously optimistic um, value. It is uh, robust, to put it nicely. And I, I think this is it's very important that we as a CRA recognize that if we are faced, in my opinion, with this fixed value, and then we'll be sitting as, again, as a CRA, looking at the gap, and how we deal with the gap, and as currently is um, basically described in the agreement, it's our responsibility, that um, some of the issues that we are becoming more acquainted with regarding our CRA's other obligations in um, enforcement, streetscape, cleanup, et cetera, some of our rather basic services, that this would put a even greater strain on the, uh, on the CRA. Certainly not trying to make our our guest speaker and messenger to, to feel responsible, but I do have a responsibility as chair to do everything I can to keep us fully educated about our obligations. Yes, Councilwoman DeWeese. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Luth, for coming today. And um, I'd like to rephrase what you said about him waking up every day worrying. I don't think he sleeps <laughs> worrying about what's going to be done. Um, the, the, the issue when I came on uh, the PEDC, this, uh, the, the interlocal predates my tenure on there, um, was trying to understand some of the decision-making processes. And it was actually brought up um, that these properties may be leased for a dollar a year or some lease negotiation as well. So that became a part of the conversation. Um, and it pointed directly to this issue of the CRA obligation. Um, there were discussions with Mr. Kobe and um, what I shared with Mr. Luth and Bridget Price uh, when she was on board as well, trying to get to the bottom of this in anticipation of renegotiating this. So um, I'm not sure of uh, once Mr. Asmar took the lead on this as far as discussing it, what has been discussed and worked on, um, but we do need to protect the CRA's um, interest in this. We are obligated to a large amount of, of money should that scenario play out. Um, one of my questions, though, would be, you mentioned the, the um, EDA portion of it, and I guess like many banks, you know, are having to look at write-downs on assets that they've lent against. Um, if we did get this all reappraised for current market value, and I know the EDA probably has some thresholds for what they're willing to grant on, 
does it jeopardize our standing with them or our repayment um, of, of other costs? Sure. And again, this was just a, uh, a preliminary discussion with EDA. In fact, they, they've asked us to go ahead and, and make a formal request uh, to them, which we'll be working on. Uh, you know, to put in writing, you know, what we'll be asking them to consider. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, in verbal discussions, they, they seem very willing and understanding of the current market situation. Uh, so they are, I guess, fully expecting that if we're going to be successful, uh, not only as an EDA project, but as a community and bring in new investment to this area, that we have to be more in line with what the current market rate of property would be. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess to answer your question, in, in my opinion, I think we would be considered uh, have a probably a favorable consideration of making a modification to the interlocal okay. agreement, which will allow us to be more competitive, which will allow us to hopefully bring, uh, bring investment to the area. And there was also some conversation, um, uh, I think during one of the tours that we did once the infrastructure was complete, about making adjustments to who was allowed to develop in the, the, the tech park or partner in the tech park and develop, um, that it needed to be specific companies. Has there been further discussion on that with EDA? I mean, when you have a glut in the market, um, being able to be flexible on who's interested would be uh, key. We, we do have some flexibility, and that's one of the things that we covered today. Uh, I, I would like to verify the numbers, but let me give you at least a, a bottom line. We're, we're looking at a, a commitment to EDA, as I understand it right now, of, of three new companies coming into the park. Uh, those companies will have to be in one of the uh, pre-approved target industry sectors, mm -hmm. which, uh, which is on most of our marketing material that we have, um, as well as the creation of uh, somewhere between five and 600 jobs in those particular target industry sectors. So that's not to, I guess, prohibit other development going into the park, but those are some of the minimum criteria as we outlined, or as the community outlined in its original application EDA. Uh, and if we're able to, um, again, competitively price the property, I would say that we'll probably continue to stay on that minimum obligation to EDA. Mm -hmm. And then the only other thing would be if there is still a task force in place that was meeting monthly. I know the PEDC meets four times a year, so we probably should pick up the pace on that. Um, if, there, if you need assistance from the city and right. county, I don't know what the status of that is. Uh, we, we probably will be reaching out. Like I said, our, our first step is to work through, uh, again, the, the modification of their local agreement and then have that obviously uh, approved and adhered or agreed to by EDA. Uh, that's probably one of our first steps because, again, that's going to allow us to uh, determine what, the, what our ability is to, you know, sell the, sell the property at. That's correct. Right. Thank you, and thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, for bringing this today. Thank you. I'm just going to go around the room. Councilwoman Myers, okay. no. Councilman Wu, Mr. Johnson. Yes, remind, remind me, Scott, who did the appraisal in uh, 07 and uh, the $8.3 million appraisal? Do you remember who did that? I'm just curious. Uh, no, unless Ryan may have it. I don't have that with me. Yes, uh, the county's property was appraised by Asmar Appraisal Company, and the city's property was appraised by Charles Sherrill. Thank you. <coughs> Councilwoman Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to go back to your $50 square foot um, number for the infrastructure. Does that count the Tech Park Pond, that, or Admiral Mason Pond, that the city put in that infrastructure as well? or uh, It does not include the pond itself, but what it includes, too, is all the infrastructure required to connect to that pond. Right, That's right. Correct. Okay, because I know we put put a pretty penny in on that as well and so that that I think in some sense raises the price of the or the value in that um, I guess it's not value until someone wants it but the investment in that in that property um, and then in terms of the looking at the inner local is there any potential that you think that um, the county would be willing to consider looking at the CRA's basically brokenness and the fact that if you know it, it's always been an unusual arrangement that um, you know if the if the powers that be say oh we're just going to give this land because there's no skin off our backs it goes on the CRA right. what sort of checks and balances can we hope we would have because I mean I, I understand there has to be a backstop somewhere but you know we if you called and said, okay, we need, you know, $100,000, we'd say, all right, you can't have it. So, so what, what are the potentials for 
taking some of this burden off of the CRA? Uh, and again, it, it'd be hard for me to, again, to, to speak on behalf of the county, uh, other than the conversations that I've had. I know that their intent, I believe, is just like PDC and the chambers and, and the cities, and that's to put the property into use. Um, so I think with that willingness and with that being the primary goal is, is job creation and, and coming up with a, a structure that makes sense to allow us to do that. I would hope that there would be a willingness or assume there's a willingness for everybody to sit down and relook at that document to see how best to structure that. Uh, one of the other questions that we'll be posing to EDA, at least uh, to, to see what flexibility we have, but in my conversation this morning, uh, that EDA is expecting that the property be sold for fair market value. And that's what led us to the question about how do we reset or how do we define what fair market value is. So okay. that may go back to answer your question with EDA's oversight in this project. Uh, <coughs> gifting or, or, or giving that property away does not seem to be an option and not that I would advocate that anyway. But, okay. but that's, that's a little bit of a checks and balances that's in the system as I currently understand it. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'll just I'd like to add a final comment now that everyone else has spoken. Um, Certainly, I, uh, I think it's important that this item be fully understood um, by all of us because actually, Councilwoman Pratt, you've pointed to the, to, the, to the question or you've led us to the point in the future um, that we are all asking ourselves what happens when we do have to pay the piper. And the only reason that hasn't become as painful as we all can imagine it uh, could be is because that sale, that transaction, real world transaction has not occurred. We're not faced with looking at a um, perceived or a, a, again, a transaction price today versus that um, former, as I described, robust valuation of $50 a square foot. And by the way, one of the reasons that probably is that higher was is that it was taking into account that off-site stormwater facility, thus allowing for um, maximizing the use of the building footprint, not having to allocate individually for those um, buyers um, space for non-income generating water treatment facilities on site. But most importantly, what I want everyone to think about um, that is in addition to Councilwoman DeWeese's um, inquiries about what is this sort of look back opportunity now, uh, not only for in our situation, but certainly on a federal level, we must not be the unique isolated case in which there has been EDA grants that have been based on former valuations that today um, are just simply not possible to um, uphold. But I want to remind CRA members that one of the reasons that we were able and I as a former not a CRA member but just a CRA resident property owner a citizen is one of the selling points and and very much a, a strong um, the, the advocacy for this project really focused on exhibit C in the interlocal agreement that being the development criteria that spelled out those target industries that this project specifically was funded for. So there were some use and performance provisions that I consider to, to be very important to sustain in, in the context of this re-valuation and re-evaluation. Yes, we, I, I certainly support looking at any sort of opportunities in which our obligation can be reduced. Um, and don't know if you, by the way, Mr. Luth, need any sort of formal action on our part to support your appeal. But again, we had some development criteria, most importantly, the target industries that the business community felt that if Pensacola could land these target industries that that would provide a very beneficial supportive um, segment that in, that in fact was not displacing replacing or competing with some of our important 
business citizens, um, but would or business entities, but would in fact augment it. And um, please remember, there were many public meetings that provided um, evidence that we wanted to see information technology, information um, assurance and security, web applications, software development, bioinfor bioinformation, avionics engineering, human performance technologies, and life sciences. So um, I, I feel like it's very important that we hold on to that. Yes, Councilwoman DeWeese. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me speak twice. I just uh, thought dawned on me um, about negotiations, uh, since I can't talk to Councilman Johnson, and I think Councilman Townsend is the other member of PEDC, um, to urge the county's uh, deference on this. I know that um, a little history always helps, and the actual the property that the county gave for the tech park was uh, from the gift closet. Um, that we had given them to develop the Civic Center. So it was actually originally city given to the county and then given back. So maybe they can bring a little extra patience with our, our need to adjust the CRA commitment and um, you know, defer to what we're trying to renegotiate on the interlocal. I thought that might be valuable information. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, thank, you. thank you, Scott. Thank you. And I know you've got to head off to a meeting. All right, next item for discussion is the Hicksart Economic Development Agreement. Um, this is our opportunity to um, be brought up to speed on some relevant dates and terms of that agreement. Um, and our CRA Administrator, uh, Ryan Winterberg Lip, will provide that. And she promised me she's going to speak slowly. That we're not in a rush. Uh, so based upon a request from Councilwoman Pratt, I've provided a very brief outline of some of the relevant dates contained within the Hicksart Economic Development Agreement. Uh, so with the two amendments that were approved by this body in March and July, respectively, of this year, uh, the timeline is now pushed back approximately 11 months. Uh, those were to the closing date and the financing deadline. Uh, so it's important to note, however, that the employment obligation dates are not tied to those closing to the closing date and the financing deadline. Uh, they are fixed dates instead. Uh, they're included at the very bottom of your memo. Uh, the employment obligation uh, deadlines occur on October 30th of every year from 2013 to 2016, where Hicksart must demonstrate that they have provided 25 full-time jobs and also retained those jobs, uh, each one building upon the previous year. So that in 2016, they have uh, provided and retained 100 full-time new jobs. Uh, so the first 25 full-time employees, that deadline will occur on October 30th of 2013. <clears throat> and then as we discussed in our July CRA board meeting, Hicksart and Beach Community Bank will be returning to this body to request subordination of the CRA mortgage in favor of the Beach Community Bank construction loan and the SBA financing. And I've spoken to Mr. Hicks, and that will likely be occurring in November of this year. We do have one CRA board meeting that month uh, due to the holiday schedule. So that will be coming back before you with all of the required documentation uh, per the terms of the agreement. So are there any questions about the deadlines and where we stand? Yes, Councilman Wu. If I understand it correctly, sure. the subordination means that they're asking the city to be the second line? We may actually be the third, uh, the CRA. Um, I believe Beach Community Bank and the Small Business Association financing would take precedence, uh, so we may be third in line on the value of the property if that subordination were, be, were to be approved. Now, who would be second, did you say? I believe Small Business, Small Business Association excuse me, would take the first position, <clears throat> and then Beach Community Bank would take the second. Now, uh, help me out here. Mm -hmm. What the small business? Uh, it is a federal program. Um, I believe they offer gap financing. I'm not s sure of the specifics of this individual program. There are many different financing packages, uh, but Hicksart is using a combination of different financing options uh, to finance the project. Okay, but mm -hmm. but right now we're not certain about what the second. Uh, what the second group will do or will not do? No, no, it's likely that we would be asked to take the third position, though. 
<clears throat> and that's going to be coming, excuse me, <clears throat> before you in November uh, after they can assemble the required documentation. As you remember, they'd have to have the construction plans, detailed outline of their financing package, um, as well as a formal request. So The second group, is that is that providing funding for any other projects in the city? No, no, no. It's just for this particular site, for the construction of their building on Government Street. Have we ever used this? agency before the small business association um i'm not sure they they would lend directly to hicksart okay thank yeah, you that, that would be part of their financial package and okay. cra would be as as part of the total package we would be asked to be taking third position last question uh, yes mr president and i'll be done uh, um is there uh, amount that they will guarantee uh, amount they would guarantee to the cra uh well toward the loan um Given our position as third, it's it's difficult to say um, in the event of default what we would likely regain on the value of the property. Um, I haven't seen their official request yet. That's that's something that we will present in November. I'm afraid I don't have much information about the, the specific terms yet. They're still working that out with their two financing agencies. Okay. Well, my confidence will grow greater with solid numbers. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> yes. Councilman Johnson, any I'm comments? I'm good, thank you. All right. Councilwoman Pratt. I'm okay, thanks. All right. Um, I want to remind fellow CRA members that I placed, well, we, we wanted to have this on the agenda, and my goal is, as your chair, is to play whatever positive role I can to help Mr. Hicksart be um, successful in this endeavor. We heard from f fellow council members at our last meeting their concerns that, that perhaps there wasn't a context that was being created um, or facilitated to help um, as much as possible or to maximize Mr. Hicksart's success. I, I want to do everything that I can do, and I ask for your participation in removing any and all of those barriers. Um, and one of, one of my suggestions to Mr. Hicksart, perhaps you remember um, when we finished um, having the, the lengthy discussion about extending the deadline, was perhaps um, a project development coordinator, a project manager, would be appropriate for Mr. Hicksart to identify and employ. Putting together a multi-million dollar office building is an ambitious endeavor. There are lots of moving parts, especially for this Hicksart project, as we all know, uh, in addition to a primary lender, that being a bank, he has the additional um, responsibilities thus far in his lending package to meet the requirements of the SBA, um, which is, again, very complex. The one bit of housekeeping that I think, Ryan, you have made me aware of uh, is that we have certain performance milestones that now have descriptions of, I'll say, parts and pieces widgets. In this case, the widgets are jobs. That's the product we are hoping that um, Mr. Hicks will deliver for us. And we are out of sync on the creation or the delivery of the jobs in our current agreement. Um, as I see it, we may be asking for some of those jobs to be occurring in a uh, parking lot or in a half-constructed building because we've moved the, our agreement deadlines back. So I think it's um, on, an, on a uh, just strictly housekeeping sort of perspective, it, is, it would be wise for us to have Ryan as our CRA administrator bring everything basically so there's alignment. Um, I, right now, I know that you have had some contact with Mr. Hicks, mm -hmm. and I'm looking to you, fellow CRA members, for guidance. Um, I have no problem with, with Ryan initiating discussions and, and at first putting a draft in front of 
uh, in front of him that would be just a logical shift of those milestone dates so they are back in line with what was in the original agreement. And again, those, are, those primarily would be jobs coming online that were related to the length of time um, that was, had, a, had an equation, basically a formula, tied to the execution. Yes? On that issue, I I've, have, my recollection is poor, but I recall that Mr. Hicks, when he came, said that he's already started some of the hiring. Is, is the hiring that he started already, would that count towards his additional jobs come October? I mean, I understand that he can sort of fit a few spare people in his building now. And so I, I guess my leaning might be to wait and see if he asks us for it. And, you know, we would be amenable because we understand these delays. But I, I don't know if there's a need to be going at going after him to offer him that will extend it if he doesn't feel the need. So that would be my leaning. My concern, um, Councilwoman Pratt, is I think some of these employment obligations may exceed the capacity of his current building. And I guess I'm just thinking he'll ask us as opposed to us. Banging well, we, his we currently have then um, a document that is heading into the world of contradiction. I guess I'm fine with her working with him if, if the need arises as, as it goes forward. But I, I guess I just don't know that we need to be going to him and saying, OK, we'll, we'll extend this, we'll extend that, unless he feels the need for us to do that. Because I, I mean, my understanding is even had everything rolled smoothly, the, the chances that he would be able to have everything in place ready for that October 2013 deadline were small. You know, it, you know, getting the sure. the plans drawn, the building built, that that's a pretty quick turnaround. Had the contract happened in the spring of this year, you know, and so I guess he was always saw a cushion as I read it, and so um, I'm I'm not opposed to letting him know that we are amenable to changes, but I, I, I assume he'll let us know if there, there are terms that he would not be able to fulfill at this point that he's aware of. And, and I, I, I hope this is not at all taken as any negative commentary about Mr. Hicks. I think he's a fine gentleman. He's extremely busy. It's a growing business. He has already shown our administrator that his business growth is something that is occupying most of his time, and he has found it difficult to actually divert his attention to some of the details of this contract. So I'm trying to keep this board basically as, as applying uniformly some some application of, of our criteria standards. Um, so that's why I, I, I don't consider it putting him at all under any pressure. I just think that it's inevitable, and I'm, I'm finding that that sort of action to just be proactive housekeeping instead of reactionary. That's fine. All right. No further comments, and, and Ryan, you have no further updates. Um, yes, I rec would like to recognize an audience member, and and I recognize Ms. Dottie uh, Dubasson. Thank you very much. Are, are you finished with the two topics? Or are we still on the second um, topic? I am. I'm still on the. When you raised your hand, I thought we were still on topic two. Yes. Okay, um, I, I just wanted to point out. I believe your proactive uh, suggestion is a very positive one, and I would like to see the CRA empower um, Ms. Wittenberg a little to negotiate um, and to help Mr. Hicksart since the SBA portion of it has not been finalized. I believe the deadlines that the SBA activities actually occur will be the triggering dates and any jobs that he creates prior to that they may not count so if we could bring whatever we do to be in compliance with whatever 
that funding entity would do this. You know, Small Business Administration has some very exact uh, corridors of performance, and if we could just allow her to then come back and give you the recommendations, but in negotiations, they would know that this group is, is willing to do that. I think it's a very important acknowledgement for them to have during their negotiations. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I think you have our um, endorsement, Ms. Winterberg Lip, sure. to, um, to proceed. Thank you, Ms. Dubasan. Any other comments on that topic? All right, I'm moving on to information items on the agenda. Our administrator, our CRA administrator, will now give us, um, as per Councilwoman Meyer's request, um, an update on CRA projects and activities. And as I understand, this update, this update will be a regularly um, scheduled agenda item. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Um, many of these items you, you've seen before in our in the previous update that I provided. Uh, these are some that are coming sort of in the immediate term and things that I'm currently working on. Of course, we are working on the conversion of Spring and Balin streets to two-way traffic. That's something that uh, Public Works and I have been working very closely on. We will be giving the notice to proceed to the contractor in September with full completion, hopefully towards the end of November, maybe beginning of December. About a 60 to 90 day completion timeline on that. Uh, then again, we have the potential transfer of Bayfront Parkway from the Florida Department of Transportation to the city of Pensacola, which again arose out of uh, conversations through the Baywalk project, that physically how much land do we have to work with with this project? Is our Baywalk going to be more uh, landward or extend more out into Pensacola Bay. Of course, that would affect both the scope of the project and the cost. Uh, so I'm researching some of the intricacies of such a transfer, um, especially the costs associated with annual maintenance and potential costs in the event of, say, another Hurricane Ivan, another destructive force on that roadway. Uh, then the Baywalk project, um, an approval of a contract, will be coming before you um, at DAG Architects was selected by our uh, review committee, so we will be uh, approving a contract for the design services of that project, again tied to the transfer of Bayfront Parkway. Uh, then of course the Hicksart Economic Development Agreement, which you saw before you today. Um, I'm also currently providing staff to the Mayor's Urban Redevelopment Advisory Committee. They will be wrapping up in October with their final report. We have another meeting on Friday, if anyone would like to attend, it'll be from noon until 6 p.m., so mm -hmm. bring a snack. Uh, then the CRA Commercial Facade Grant Program, I'm working with a couple different small businesses to award the remaining funds in that project, or sorry, in that program. Um, World of Beer will be receiving a, a small grant for some replacement windows, as well as some um, potential uh, businesses down on the south side of Palafox for some new signage. Uh, then, of course, I've been working with uh, Sherry Morris in our planning department for the streamlining of our sidewalk dining permitting process. As you know, uh, you've seen them when you sit on city council, that currently sidewalk dining is processed through the standard license to use the right-of-way procedure, and it takes somewhere between two to three months. It can be rather um, excessive on some uh, new, new startup businesses, where we'll also be looking at uh, streamlining some processes, maybe upgrading some of our standards and making them a little bit more clearly defined. That will be going to our planning board in September, and then, of course, before you as city council, probably later in the fall, depending on how planning board decides. Um, then upcoming, um, as you may notice, the tenant at our Plaza de Luna concession stand, de Luna's last stand, their lease did expire and they chose not to renew. So they're currently in the process of removing their equipment. They have 30 days to do that. So we hope to issue a new RFP for a new concessionaire. Uh, then, uh, before you in September, you'll be seeing both as CRA and as City Council the termination of an agreement between the port and the CRA for the leasing of the Cedar Street Warehouse parking lot. Uh, there was sort of a strange, circuitous agreement established uh, years ago where the port actually owns those parking lots. The CRA leases them from the port and then leases them through a tenant. Uh, so we will be eliminating the CRA as this kind of third party and uh, having the lease then be approved directly through the port and tenant. Uh, so you would see a first a termination agreement before you to remove the CRA from that internal agreement and then an approval of the lease uh, as city council with the port. 
Um, then um, we are exploring the expansion of the marina management lease area. That's the area that you see at um, Jocko's down on South Palafox by Plaza de Luna in order to potentially expand their building. Uh, they're interested in doing some additional storage space, so that would require an amendment of their current lease area. That was something established, I think, originally um, in the mid-90s or so. And then uh, for the begin of beginning of fiscal year 2013, we of course do have a couple governing interlocal documents that um, define the relationship between the CRA and our various other entities. You'll be seeing uh, the landscape maintenance interlocal come before you um, in September that would need to be reapproved before the fiscal year begins again on October 1. Uh, the community policing interlocal agreement no longer has a value associated with it. Uh, that was something you'll remember from the budget presentation that was eliminated. So that would not be coming before you for reapproval. And then, of course, the administration interlocal agreement would expire in January of 2013. So that's a very brief update on some immediate current and upcoming projects, if you have any questions. Yes. Councilwoman DeWeese. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just have two questions. Uh, during our discussion for the spring and Balin Street two-way, um, I had been contacted by several citizens that are urgently wanting bike, bike paths mm -hmm. added. And one of those suggestions was that you have a southbound bike path on mm -hmm. one of them and a northbound on the other. And I don't know at what point that needs to be addressed or discussed. Um, that's not my district. Uh, I simply spoke up. I sure. know that a lot of us are very concerned about complete streets and the, the um, improvements that we make going mm -hmm. forward. Um, how do we follow up on that request sure. to see if it's feasible? Uh, the actual re-striping and repainting the thermoplasty that would be installed on those roadways would happen towards the very end of the project. Mm -hmm. so there's certainly some time for flexibility there. Um, I did speak to the DIB and they were very concerned about the loss of on-street parallel parking. So I think that's something we would have to manage closely because there are a lot of businesses and residents that rely completely on that on-street parking. Mm -hmm. Um, so if there is physical space, physical room, uh, we could certainly meet with Public Works and then uh, also with the contractor who designed the physical plans and see if there's any room okay. to, uh, to integrate that. So you well. mentioned on-street parking for residents. Is that an area that doesn't require off-street parking? It does not. Provided? It does, it does not. One of those um, areas. Yeah, okay. it does not. All right, well, we don't want that to be a problem. So sure. if there's any way to balance that, Absolutely. that's why I said maybe one bike lane, mm -hmm. you know, going down and one coming back, and that seemed like logical. And the other thing is the pit slip lease. Is that a consideration of the CRA? I believe that is a CRA uh, development agreement from the 80s. Okay, because I know that that, I believe, I'm not certain, is coming up uh, that expires and needs to be renegotiated. Can you um, can we add that. that to the next agenda? to see when it actually expires and the status of sure. it. There's actually three different areas of that, the slip itself, the parking area to the south, and then the parking area to the west okay. of the development there. Um, I'd be interested in finding out about that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Councilwoman Myers. Uh, yes, I want to thank you for uh, the uh, nice uh, update uh, you did. It's very helpful to have this on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just wondering, uh, we have a city council committee on complete streets, uh, and uh, we will be meeting, I think our first meeting is Friday. We're trying to, yeah. You know, and I, I'm just wondering, are, will you be av av available? Will you be attending that meeting? Depends on what time it is. I it's at 9 o'clock on Friday. 9 a.m. Uh, should be. Because you're, you know, you and I have talked about the survey that's been done of the sidewalks sure. in the CRA area. And uh, so your uh, input would, is, I think, very vital. So I would really, really like to see you attending those meetings. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Great idea. Uh, Councilman Wu? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, when I ask the questions, Ryan, it's not a Please don't misunderstand. It's not a reflection that I, you know, questioning mm -hmm. what y'all are doing. And I think that you're covering the points that I'm concerned about. Uh, and that goes back to the transfer of the Bayfront from FDT uh, sure. DT, uh, to us. Mm -hmm. And I believe that you, you've got it covered. Um, the main things is with the transfer would come with the financial obligation from the state to us. Mm -hmm. And we're having trouble paving the streets we have. So before we do it, you know, I'd be very interested in knowing how much it costs to pave that particular roadway 
and I think you have it covered also in case of a hurricane, how much would it cost the city versus the state to replace sure. that thing? Because I remember during Ivan, huge sections of it were, were mm -hmm. devastated. And uh, when it's under the ownership of the state, the state comes in and repairs it. If we transfer ownership to us, we'll be the ones to be doing it. And I'd like those numbers before, you know. Sure, and that's... But I think you had that yeah. in your report. So, and last thing, thank you for the fine job you're doing. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I want to assure um, Councilman Wu, I know he has made it um, abundantly clear that this is one of his concerns. And um, we're fortunately, at the, at the recent um, ECUA, basically back to the future, ceremony last week an individual was recognized uh, he was actually sitting in the audience should have probably been right up there up front but as one of the key individuals that was our liaison our community's liaison uh, the conduit to fema and that individual um is, has we are tapping into his knowledge and we're also with the help of some other people that worked with FEMA through that process we are getting some very um, important accurate information that uh, regarding FEMA's participation down to the dollar amount per event um, it's all historical and including what sort of investment was made in the um, the buttressing, so to speak, of that roadway. So I feel like we will be able to make a, a, an informed decision ab about the city's exposure as it relates to that. And it's kind of interesting, the synchronicity or confluence of, of all of this coming together as we are considering what can we do to enhance the pedestrian experience and invite more people to enjoy our waterfront. Well, we're going after this this grant um, for the construction of Bay Walk, I want everyone to know that grant money is not in hand. The only thing the CRA will be approving will be the allocation of funds for the design and engineering of a project that becomes a more viable candidate for further grant funding in the form of physical improvements and enhancements. So. We will not be looking at or considering um, any sort of money that will, in fact, construct a baywalk. We are simply engaging a firm to create a packet that makes us perhaps a finalist in the beauty pageant, so to speak. Um, but as we study that, we also, um, what we're balancing is how can that baywalk project be maximized with limited funding and what happens if we are able to utilize more of the let's let's call it the basically the land that's already there um, as opposed to having to perhaps spend a lot more dollars per experiential linear foot with some sort of bay walk that is um, extended out over the waterway that has greater restrictions is certainly more cumbersome from a permitting standpoint and um, so we're, we're trying to marry all of this how to again make our our downtown waterfront or our city's waterfront more accessible more usable and um, at an affordable cost yes thank you mr. chair I'll make mine very quick um, thank you very much for a very informative uh, presentation you know, at the beginning of this meeting, we, we have these disclosures um, about who owns property in the CRA, et cetera. And, and I noticed the uh, staff contact uh, here is you and another gentleman here that works at City Hall. I'd like uh, from here on out when we discuss these uh, issues that are going to be coming before us in the future, could we um, also get a disclosure on who he deals with privately also in some of these issues? Um, I think Ms. Uh, Deweese had an issue about the pit slip and I don't know if any of these that or any of these clients are his privately I think I'd like that disclosure if we could I may defer to our city attorney on that one <laughs> <laughs> if our chief of staff does business with any of these folks privately I'd like it disclosed when, when we deal with them publicly 
Is that, I, I would think that would be reasonable. Sure. Okay. If you would include that next time. Sure. Thank you. All right, Councilman Johnson. Um, next, Councilwoman Pratt. I'm good, thanks. All right. Thank you. That, um, that concludes our report from our CRA administrator. Thank you for that update. Um, uh, is there any new business? If not, I adjourn CRA. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I call to order the uh, committee a whole. Uh, my understanding is President Hall is on his way. Councilman Townsend is ill. Councilman Geralds, I believe, is on his way. And so as luck would have it. Yeah, you got the superstar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I don't know about that. Um, yeah, no, right we'll start off with board uh, forum. Uh, we have one speaker, uh, Mr. David Beer. Two speakers, I'm sorry. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, council, thank you very much, or committee rather. Um, uh, at the last committee of the whole, you guys, um, well, it was a budget workshop, uh, and I was here representing ACE funding request, and uh, the council had requested that I provide some background information uh, of what we did this past year, and nobody told me when to bring it to you or deliver it to you, so I thought this might be the right forum, so I, I brought copies to distribute today. And I don't know how you want me to distribute uh, them. Clerk. Just, Just uh, give them. Give them to the clerk. Uh, okay. Right, if you, if you would give them to the clerk. And And I don't know if anybody has any questions, but obviously I, you haven't um, had an opportunity to review it. We'll, we'll give, give them just a second. I think the dilemma is they're just getting it, so I don't know I if they're going to have enough time to process it and then, then respond to you, but we'll okay. see. Mr. Chairman. But if you'd like, I can give yes. you a okay. Could we just ask that if anyone has any questions, um, they could follow up with Mr. Bayer, and if there are some significant questions a excellent suggestion request that he a come visit suggestion. us again if there's uh, something great. terribly yes. pressing yes uh, does anybody on council have uh, uh, any problem with that uh, suggestion that if we have any questions we just will get a hold of uh, mr. Baird directly yeah. okay mm -hmm. before we let you go let yes, me sir. thank you very much for your hard work uh, you've spent an awful lot of time putting this together you have spent a lot of your personal time in making sure that the arts have gotten the attention it has. And on behalf of the council, I would like to thank you for your efforts. Thank you for what you all do and your commitment. Thank, right. you. thank you very much. Thank Thanks. Next speaker that we have is Mrs. Sonia Merritt. I'm Sonia Merritt from 805 South J Street in Sanders Beach. What I was wondering when we would ever be getting permanent parking in Sanders Beach and some of the other areas like the Mariner Park and that you don't have adequate parking. And as a citizen, I don't, I can't go home at night when you hold something at Sanders Beach because I don't have off-street parking. So I'm forced to park a block or two blocks away from my home until the event's over at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. You know, and there, I'm not the only one in Sanders Beach that this is happening to. Besides the belligerent act, voice we get when we ask people to be quiet at 11 o'clock, we, you know, people have cussed us out and a few other things have been said to us at Sanders Beach, and I've notified the park managers and they don't seem to care. I mean, the city just doesn't still build parking, you know. Now, uh, I believe that you appeared before us. Uh, city Council. Right, City Council. This was probably several weeks week ago. Week ago, last week, last I, meeting. Has anybody from the city gotten back with you? Yes, and Mr. Spears said when they got my money, the city would look into building permanent parking. Well, you did get some money just recently. In fact, the day he called me, it was in the paper. <laughs> But, uh, you know, you just, you build the manor park, and like I brought up, the point was those parking lots will eventually be, that you're parking on the vacant lot, will be, uh, hopefully, have businesses in them. 
you know, Sanders Beach, there's, there is empty places around there you could purchase, obviously, for some one reason or another, it's not being done. But we've notified Sanders Beach, talked to them from day one, that you were building a little over 100 and the place would hold 500. And they said, well, you'll just have fun someplace else to park. There's only so far to go in that little area. Is the dilemma finding a place to park in front of, or dilemma parking at your the home. house? I can't go home at night because I don't have off-street parking. And it's the more and more the park gets used at Sanders Beach, especially as hopefully the other ones are, it becomes more inconvenient to the neighbors of those airing parks. It's not just me. There's other areas you, you, you hold these events, and then there's nowhere for the people who live there to park. They mentioned something about a pass. I don't know how that would work at Sanders Beach. I mean, I can't put something. They don't listen to barriers. They don't listen to signs you put up. They don't really care the people coming. I mean, they just figure, well, I got closer, so I'm close enough to the park. Yeah. When you go to park, is there someone blocking your driveway? I don't have off-street parking. Oh, you don't have off-street When we bought parking. the home, okay. there were no off-street parking available okay. at that home. And there's several homes. If you go to Round Center Beach, there's a lot of homes that are like that and the closer to the water area. Now, in Cypress, obviously, they have off-street, but on the side streets, you don't always have off-street. Without belaboring it, and I probably am going to ask staff to re relook at it, um, how do you feel about the permit um, suggestion? In other words, it would be off limits to anybody in that particular area, except for anybody that has a decal that you would have. Would you, do you think that would eliminate your problem? I don't think they would even pay attention. They can't read the sign that tells you what time the park is open and closed. I don't think they would really care about that either, the people coming into the neighborhood. Well, then one it's last quite obvious they can't read. One last question, um, and then I'll refer it to staff, unless any of the council members have anything they'd like to put. Do you have a suggestion? Perhaps buying enough, when you build these parks, buy enough property to build the adequate parking spaces for the park that you're building. I mean, but I mean to that has to be a forethought. We do as business owners. I had to think about that. That came down. Then make sure you buy enough property to accommodate, you know, certain things. The vegetation you have to put down, the water drain. I mean, but when the city builds, they do not have to obey these rules. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, yes, Council, yes. Dr. Wood. Um, well, it seems like to me that this um, is an issue that the um, city administrator's office should be addressing. Uh, I do believe there's probably a solution. I know that uh, in the county over at um, Navy Point Park, where the park is, um, uh, they have similar problems that have been solved by putting no parking signs where residents live. So uh, I think that this is an, an issue that our public works department, I, I assume uh, Mr. Garza is in charge of traffic. Is that true? Who, who, well, Mr. Reynolds, I'm just going to pass this issue over, over to you <laughs> since the mayor's office runs the day-to-day um, activities of the city, I think that this uh, issue should be addressed to the mayor's office, and if that doesn't work, then come back and maybe we can pass an ordinance or something to address it. Uh, clearly, uh, this is a long-term problem that's going to cause, or that's going to require a long-term solution, and uh, you know, whether that be buying property in the area, uh, you know, I can't guarantee that. That obviously takes a willing seller and the money to do it. Uh, but there are other, you know, there could be other options as well. But uh, this isn't something that, uh, you know, that that we are simply going to be able to snap our fingers and solve. Uh, I think that whatever the solution is, and it may be uh, passing some kind of uh, ordinance in regards to parking in the area for residents, 
uh, you know, we can certainly do that if that's what uh, this body wants us to look at. But, uh, you know, clearly it's, it, this situation has been around since uh, Sanders Beast has, has, been, uh, has been there. So, uh, you know, it's going to take some time to develop a solution to the problem. I'll be glad to speak uh, with you uh, after the meeting, or you can send me an email. We can communicate by email, and there's some areas over in the county you might want to go look at to see how they've addressed uh, similar problems, especially over at the uh, Navy Point uh, Park, the walkway over there. Okay. Uh, yes. I, yes, I'm sorry, Councilman. This is, I think this is a, a perfect example where we've got um, one citizen that has spoken to us with a, a very serious problem. And when I say serious, th this is very much affecting her usability and access to her residence. And um, the irony is, is the city's a hero on one hand for delivering a wildly popular and affordable um, community uh, uh, venue that, as many of you know, if you've called to, to arrange any sort of event, whether it be for a philanthropic organization or private use, it is one of the most heavily booked city facilities. So if we graded it just in that context, it, uh, it earns an A+. Plus. Um, I went over and looked at the situation last week after um, our last council meeting, and I, c I could immediately see how um, an event that only is attracting one half of the capacity of the facility will basically put a, cho a stranglehold on the, uh, um, on the neighborhood regarding use by the full-time 24-hour residents. So again, it's ironic. We have implemented um, some obstacles ourselves. We have we've funded ourselves into this situation. Um, I was curious, and I want to go ahead and maybe maybe the citizen can can answer. Um, what are our opportunities uh, to use the? Um, am, am I right that Grotto Hall? that the neighboring parking facilities aren't being used? Um, not during those events. They're parking on the guys vacant lot that he calls the tow truck. Right. So uh, you, what I saw was a capacity for parking, an adjacent parking facility that would begin to solve this problem. And so there we already have um, impermeable surface of parking, a sea of parking, that prevents necessary um, use. I mean, it would really optimize the, the situation or optimize the facility. And there's a chain link fence that prevents this from happening. I stood there, I walked around it, and I thought, we've got to figure out how to use this. So that, um, I just want to share that with our city administrator that there's a parking facility, and um, I just don't think anyone in this room can imagine how frustrating it is unless you live in a residence that during one of our successful events, you can't get to your house. It's, it's not at all dissimilar to situations. The, the one most familiar to me as a former Tulane student um, is the New Orleans Jazz Festival, which those residents only have to deal with for a two-week time period around the, um, the, the grounds where that festival occurs. But um, I learned quickly when I came back to get my car as a Tulane student, and it was not there, um, what I needed to do to abide by parking regulations. Um, but we need, we need to act on this. I know that, um, Mr. Reynolds, you said it's a, it's a long-term solution, and I'm, I'm just reminding um, everyone here that if, if it's our house, we, we want a short-term short solution. And I, am, I, too, will do what I can if it means um, participating in discussions with the adjacent property owner. And, and if I may, uh, and, 
may remind uh, council, uh, you know, we have just passed an ordinance that allows for special use permit parking. Uh, and it might be good to inform those adjacent landowners that they might actually have a money-making opportunity ahead of them. Mm -hmm. So, um, as, as, a, as opposed to just closing it off, you know, they have an opportunity to actually make a buck because you have now allowed that part of your special use permit parking program. Thank you. We started talking about Mr. this Mayor, before you built Sanders Beach. And the answer from the gentleman who was in charge of the Parks and Recreation was, too bad. I mean, well, that's not an answer for people like me. I'm 50-some years old. I don't want to walk two blocks home at night in the dark. You know, one thing during the day, but it's night. But this has been going on for, you know, since the new park was invested. I think what, what, what I would like to do, Mr. Uh, Chairman. If I can get people to address the chair, please. Okay. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I, I'm curious about the um, calculations of the square footage of the assembly hall and what the parking provisions are on a on a, um, a occupancy type. I, I definitely want to find out if we have met our own um, land development code parking requirements, or were we able to compromise? ourselves as a um, municipal or did we choose to make any concessions and I apologize for no no no, lack no of procedure you, you are not alone right. <laughs> you are not alone um, anyone else on council uh, anyone in the audience uh, mrs. Merritt I have no uh, you know I, I, I cannot tell you what to do I, I do realize you have a dilemma uh, I would implore you to reconsider the permit at least as a stop ma um, stopgap measure uh, for folks who do not have a driveway um, because there could be a, a system of signage that a does not allow you to block a driveway and then b for those folks who don't have a driveway like yourself uh, that you can park there only with a permit uh, given that i don't see the situation getting better and I see that as a step at least giving you some temporary relief. Uh, in the ideal world, as far as buying land, uh, that, that is a long and costly uh, proposition. And uh, if, uh, you know, I would not encourage you to put your hope in having that done in any immediate, you know, near future. Anyone else? Uh, next speaker we have is uh, Mrs. Nan Harper, and, and Ms. Harper, before you come, I see that you want to talk about the advisory board, and that is on the agenda later, and if you would like, we can let you speak now or wait to that time. Okay. And then the next speaker we have is uh, Laura McKnight. Thank you, Councilman Wu. Uh, I'm Laura McKnight, 4200 Langley Avenue, Pensacola, and I'm here this, this afternoon on behalf of the Council of Neighborhood Presidents of Pensacola, CNAP. Um, and we just had a question in regard to the upcoming budget. Um, in this year's budget, there was $142,200 budgeted for the neighborhood enhancements. And of that money, um, $20,468.07 has been spent so far this year. And what the Council of Presidents would like to ask for your consideration is that the, um, the remaining funds that are left over in that line item as of October 1st be carried over into capital improvements for our park improvements. Uh, for the upcoming fiscal year and that was it <laughs> thank you very much any response from council any questions uh, yes council Myers uh, ha have you sent out any information to the other neighborhood associations regarding that presidents I uh, no, ma'am we'll be discussing that at our meeting tomorrow evening okay um, I don't okay well just send me an email if, if, if you will so that I can look at that line item that you're talking about. Okay. Okay. Councilman. Councilwoman. Dr. Wu, I would just like to request that you send it to all council members so we can formulate that and propose it. I'd be more than happy to. It's a great idea. Thank you for your fine work. All right. Thanks. Y'all have a good afternoon. 
Okay, I do not see, is there anyone else that would like to speak? Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, uh, Councilman. May I make a request on behalf Certainly. of most of our audience that we um, move item four, the equal representation on boards, to later in the agenda and move up right after the Maritime Park land lease, the um, Government Street item, just so that they can get home and have dinner at a reasonable hour. Okay. Um, so you're talking about moving item number Item four to four. just a little later. I, I just think that if we can help the citizens have a normal life um, and not sit through a lot of our fun discussions um, that would be beneficial to them. Okay. Uh, I'm going to like to get the field of the council before we make a decision on this. Uh, those in favor? Aye. Indicate by Aye. Aye. Okay. So we will then proceed to that section. I don't think we've made a motion. Oh. Well, I don't just, know we yeah, need a motion. It's just a feel yeah. of whether the council is comfortable moving the items around. And Mr. President, for, yes. for clarification, that's item 11 then that will be moved up? Yeah, to after the, that's the Maritime Park okay. lease. So we're moving item 11 to become item number six. Um, and, well, moving four, four, four out. Down. So right, number moving four, four out. Six. Right. Okay. Well, number four will become number 11. That's correct. <laughs> Just that's right. See what he does. I guess. Just follow along. Okay, every, is, everybody fine? All right with that. Okay. Then we'll start with uh, item number one, Import, uh, appointment of International Relations Advisory Board. Yes, Ms. Harper. Good afternoon. Thank you for your service to our community. Ms. Harper, before you start, I've been informed by the clerk that we need to have the recommendation first. Okay. And that, no, don't, you don't have to leave it after which... Uh, we, we uh, will be fine. Okay. Okay. The recommendation of City Council appoint one individual to fill the unexpired term of Dr. Jack Kitchler on the International Relation Advisory Board expiring October 31st, 2011. Okay. Again, thank you for your service to our community and for allowing me to speak on this matter. I am the current president of the Pensacola okay. International Re yeah. okay. Relations Advisory Board. It is an unfunded position, and uh, I would like to speak on behalf of one of the young women who has been nominated, whose name is Brucey Glassell. She is a resident of P Perdido Key and is a business owner in Perdido Key. And she would be here today except she's with clients proving to them that the, the Key is a wonderful place to live in the rain as well. She owns her own company, as I said. And this, this committee, <coughs> this board, is largely an advisory board. And I'm here because, as you know, 2013 marks the 500th anniversary of our discovery by the Spanish explorers. Ms. Glassell accompanied a group of a delegation from Pensacola representing <coughs> Sister Cities International and the Galvez celebration, including prominent business leaders in Pensacola. Our purpose <coughs> was several fold, one of which was to visit our nearest sister city, Machada Biaya, which as you all know is the birthplace of General Galvez who single-handedly beat the British in the battle to make America independent, not really. But that trip was a trip involving people like the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Jose Palomino, who earned his wings here, in, uh, studied here in Pensacola in the flight program, is the only three-star admiral in Spain who has the aviator's wings. We met Christopher Columbus, the 20th, the president of the Malaga University, the owners of the Jorge Ordonez Vineyard, went up to the north of Spain and visited Trujillo, the hometown of Pizarro and Hernando Cortez. Don't worry, there won't be a test after this. <laughs> My point in asking you to consider Mrs. Glassell is that she, along with Joe Gilchrist, were trying to put together a group of professionals who will be a part of the interchanges next year between Spain and Pensacola. They were collecting uh, entertainers, artists, 
musicians. And as you know, they sponsor the Frank James International Songwriting Contest every year and have taken people to New York and they've gone to, to France several times in preparation for that. I feel that she has her hand on the pulse of what we will be trying to do in our city next year to bring that interaction together and can include all parts of our city and our county from Perdido Key to the beach to the northern area. And that is the reason I ask you to consider Brucey Glassell. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Ms. Harper. Okay, um, we have uh, two nominees, and I believe Ms. Harper has just spoken uh, on behalf of one. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on behalf of the first nominee? Okay, our second nominee is uh, Julie Tippins Parker. I believe Ms. Parker is here. Would you like to say a few words? First of all, I'd like to thank you, um, Councilman Wu and Councilman Johnson for nominating me. I have several years experience with Pensacola Sister City program. In fact, with the Sister City and I was the international person for the Arts Council of Northwest uh, Florida's Board of Directors. I have actually visited all the sister cities except for the one in Ukraine and the Spanish sister city. I have extremely close ties with uh, the people, the mayor and others in Miraflores. And I would like to bring the interest of international to the attention of people in Pensacola and highlight the many, many things that are being done here internationally. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, Councilwoman. Thank you, Dr. Wu, and I just want to thank Ms. Parker for her willingness to serve, and um, I see from her application she is a constituent of mine, and uh, looking at her um, experiences internationally and, and what she has, has endeavored to do here in our community, um, I think she would make a wonderful addition to the um, International Advisory Board. Thank hey, you. Thank you. Councilwoman. Yes, uh, um, I would like to, to thank uh, both uh, women for uh, offering uh, to uh, serve. Um, I will be supporting, however, uh, Ms. Parker. Uh, I think she has great uh, credentials, but also she's a, actually a resident of the city of Pensacola, and I think it's really important that we encourage people who live in the city to serve on our boards. Uh, so um, I, I will be uh, supporting her nomination too. And I just okay, want both, both women to know that I appreciate their willingness to serve and both have great credentials. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, anyone in the audience? Okay, Council, you have, a, I believe, in front of you a blank ballot. Okay, while the uh, clerk uh, tallies the ballot, our next item uh, on our agenda is appointment to uh, Parks and Recreation Board. Recommendation City Council appoint one individual to Parks and Recreation Board to fill the unexpired term of Wesley Pate, expiring March 31st, 2014. Uh, as I see it, there is only one nominee and as uh, James R. Brown, Jr., nominated by uh, Councilman Townsend, is uh, Mr. Brown here today? Do you need a motion? Okay. I move to approve by Okay, move approval. I have a second. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So we can congratulate Mr. Brown for his approval. And uh, congratulations, uh, Mrs. Parker, for your appointment to the International Board. Mrs. Harper, please tell the other lady that we do appreciate her interest in the city, and we would uh, hope that she, that interest would continue. And even though she was not successful, we do appreciate her stepping forward. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, Councilwoman. Um, before okay. we move on from the Parks and Recreation Sorry. Board, um, I, someone had brought up a concern that there may be some confusion about the two positions we added yes. during our last vote uh, because right. there was obvious support for those two nominees and that they would be approved. Yes. Um, based, and those were the two positions for them that we aren't advertising, um, but that we needed to make that clear um, right. and send them a letter and let them know because I don't know that the Parks and Recreation Board is aware of that. Of the change. Yeah, of that, that very good. Direct nomination right. for those and two. And we'll ask the clerk if she would do that. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's an excellent suggestion. Okay. Next item of agenda. Is the appointment of the uh, zoning board of adjustment. The iPad is wonderful on the work screen, right? You can read it from up there, <laughs> behind you. <laughs> the recommendation of City Council approve ordinance. No, that's item four, sorry. Yes. Maybe modern technology isn't all it's cut up to be. Uh, recommendation City Council appoint three individuals who are residents or property owners of the city to the Zoning Board of Adjustment for a term of three years expiring July 14, 2011. Uh, we have three nominees, Georgia Blackman, nominated by Councilman Townsend, uh, and she is the incumbent. Uh, Patrick, uh, is it Bo? Boudreaux, uh, incumbent, and Randy Oglesby, incumbent. Move to accept all three by acclamation. Second. Okay. And I am certainly happy to see you, Mr. President. Thank you. I will, after the vote, relinquish the seat to you here. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Okay. And if you all would bear with us for just a minute, I will take my new technology, my slow fingers, and relinquish the but it, sir, and, and as, as long as you've got the, the, the chair, you're welcome to it. Oh, no, no. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think we need to let the president know that we've changed uh, item four is actually item 11 now, and okay. item 11 becomes item four. Is Six. that correct? Oh, the other yeah, one. you got that right, but then it's after Maritime Park, I think. Yeah. Maritime it's um, after after yeah. the Maritime Park. Uh, take four out. Okay. Yeah. In other words, take take four four out. We're on the Maritime Park now. So. Okay, so that moves us to the new number four, the old number five, if you're following along on the agenda there, the Maritime Park Land Lease. And on that, the recommendation that City Council approve the land lease between the City and Maritime Place, LLC, for the development of a commercial building at the Maritime Park. 
Move the approval. Second. There's a motion and a second. Discussion. Mr. Reynolds? Nope. Mr. Spears? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members of Council, if I could at this time invite Mr. Andrew Rothfeder and Mr. Scott Remington to the table to join me. And while they're coming forward, I'd also want, uh, would like to recognize Mr. Quint Studer uh, in the audience and Mr. Chuck Tessier in the audience. Uh, both are, are pivotal uh, uh, representatives in this project and uh, will be playing a large role. One thing I would also note for you, uh, the images you'll see today are building masses. They're not particularly uh, the design that is being put forward. They're just schematics to, to get the idea of how buildings fit on this property. So the architecture will go through a, a different review process with the planning board and will come forward later. So I just wanted to, to note that. Also, having uh, watched your CRA meeting, you've had a, a very good primer on some of the things you're going to see today. Lease rates, uh, how you value property, uh, both with the Tech Park and the, and the Hicksart property. So I think you're going to see some familiar terms as we uh, go forward. The parcel in question at the Maritime Park is shaded in green here. It is uh, identified as parcel number two. It is located on Cedar Street in between Spring Street and Roos. It is directly south of the stormwater pond, directly north of the stadium. And you can see it here uh, with an arrow pointing to it and a closer up shot uh, represented here. This is a subject parcel. It is plus or minus 62,000 feet. Uh, square feet in size, we are doing uh, an official certified survey at this point in time, along with topography that will get us our actual numbers. This is a proposed site plan, uh, looking once again at building massing, how a 62 or a 60,000 plus or minus square foot building would sit on this property uh, with adjacent parking as well. And here's an, another similar view looking from north to south. And this is looking from the stadium towards the southeast, I'm sorry, to the northeast, uh, as the building would sit on the property. Uh, real quick, the timeline, as you know, in 2006, the master lease and master development agreement between the city and the CMPA uh, was executed. This project was envisioned in both of those documents, and it is detailed there. In April of 2009, a memorandum of understanding was executed between the CMPA and the Studer Group, uh, further flushing out the details of this project and bringing it forward. That memorandum of understanding was part of the conditions precedent that were required to actually execute and commence the lease at the Maritime Park property with the CMPA. In May of 2010, we had omnibus amendments to the master lease that were approved in order for the CMPA to receive the federal new market tax credits. Uh, those amendments removed the CMPA as having any interest in the private developments. Due to the restrictions of the new market tax credits, the CMPA cannot receive rental uh, revenue from real property. And so that removed the CMPA, placing the private development back onto uh, the city of Pensacola. July of 2012 and August 7th of 2012, public negotiations were held on the major uh, business terms for this particular lease. On August 13th, the CMPA had an operations and audit committee meeting. On August the 15th, the CMPA board meeting, uh, today's committee, the whole meeting, and culminating at city council, hopefully on Thursday, there will have been six opportunities for the public to review and comment on this particular lease. The key terms uh, of this lease uh, requires a 60,000 square foot office building with a minimum $12 million investment into the property. It also requires a relocation of the studio group to the office building upon completion. A 55-year lease term commencing upon the receipt of, her, of a certificate of occupancy uh, and ending when the CMPA master lease ends, which is at May of 2069. And I hope to be here for that day. Uh, the key lease terms, once again, the total rental rate of 8% has been agreed by the parties, consisting of a 7.25% rental fee and a 0.75 common area maintenance fee. Common area maintenance are the, the grounds landscaping, uh, the streets, the sidewalks, the street lights, the things that the private improvements benefit from by locating. It also includes the uh, stormwater pond, which uh, is in with your Aragon discussion and your Tech Park discussion, uh, the Admiral Mason pond there was built so that you wouldn't have to do smaller ponds uh, in the development itself. The Maritime Park is the exact same design, one large pond that drains the entire property and all of the private development ties into that pond. 
the rent is set to increase at 7% every five years. And doing that math, you will recoup your investment uh, as if you were to sell the property at year 12. And all totaled, you will receive 6.3 times the actual value of the property at the maturity of the lease. Um, the Maritime Place LLC is not requesting any special economic development incentives or tax abatements for this project. And the final, the parking fee, I'll come to in just a moment. Fair market value and the rent were determined based on an appraisal that the city commissioned. The value of the property was valued at 1.6 million uh, for approximately two acres at 80,000 square feet. The value is based on a curve created by plotting comparables in the area that were also located in the appraisal. The actual size of the parcel is being determined by survey as we speak. I will point out there's an inverse relationship to the prices I'm going to show you. As the size of the parcel decreases, the value increases and vice versa. The larger the parcel were to get, uh, the smaller the value would uh, become. The parties have agreed that the lowest value would possibly be $20 per square foot. That's based on the results of the appraisal. And there is no ceiling, so the smaller the property gets, it continues to increase in value until an agreed upon size is reached. Here is that particular curve uh, that was in the appraisal itself. <coughs> so for example, the property at 80,000 square feet at $20 a square foot is 1.6 million fair market value. At 70,000 square feet, you see the price increases per square foot to $20.24 or $1.4 million. And at 60,000 square feet, the price increases to $21.03 or two point, almost $2.3 million value. And you can compare this, I believe y'all were talking in the $50 per square foot range at the tech park. So you can see how an appraisal that was done within the last six months uh, equates to one that's several years old as far as waterfront property values in the downtown area. The fair market value of the parcel would be the price as if the property were sold. Knowing the environmental restrictions and the uh, cleanup that has been conducted, obviously we can't sell the property, so we then move into a rental situation. And so to calculate the ground lease rate, the parties reviewed the area comps presented in the appraisal. There was a rental range between 6% and 8.7%. There were 11 comparables in the, the appraisal, and their average was 6.88% and the parties agreed to a total rate of 8% with 7.25, once again being rent, 0.75 common area maintenance fee. So you take the fair market value times the rental rate, that would then equal the rent at this point in time. So once again, the parties have agreed to a formula. So if, if you see in the lease a set number, that number was generated based on our estimates, based on the construction drawings and where we currently are. They will, what we really have agreed on is this formula which is the square foot times the value per square foot times the rental rate equals the total rent, or the fair market value times the rental rate is the total. So in this case, a 62,000 square foot lot times $20.86, which is where that falls on the curve, times 8% equals an annual rent of $103,465.60, of which the city, the 7.25 rental fee is the 93000 765 and the 70.75 cam fee is just under $10,000. The estimated tax revenue from this project is just under $230,000 and that's the total tax uh, requirement including the school board, water management district, Escambia County, and City of Pensacola. The TIF portion of that, the money that would go directly to the city CRA TIF is $128,421. And that's, once again, those are estimates. It depends on the final appraised value, which is done by the property appraiser. Uh, the fair market value is reached in 12 years, and the total value, if paid out annually with the 7% increase, the city and CMPA all total would receive $8.2 million over the 55 years of the lease. Uh, parking is another one of the major issues uh, that has been discussed and uh, debated. There's a clause in the MOU, and that language was repeated in the lease, that the CMPA shall provide the minimum number of required parking spaces for a, quote, office building at 60,000 square foot. That equates to one parking space for every 300 square feet of building. It's 200 parking spaces minimum. That number could change based on use. So in wanting to have a set number, knowing exactly where we are, we've worked with um, 
the group and they have agreed to a cap, a maximum of 200 spaces that the CMPA would, would provide. And we haven't had the time to make that actual language change in the lease, but uh, Mr. Remington and Mr. Rothfeder can uh, discuss that uh, as well. The CMPA board in their approval of the lease and recommendation to you to, uh, today requested that the city provide 75% of the rent back to CMPA <coughs> as a parking facilities fee. Uh, my attempt to simplify and accomplish that, we've added one standalone clause to the lease stating basically that, that the city would pay 75% of the rent to the CMPA as a parking facilities fee. If the debate and the council wants to change the percentage or uh, do away with that clause altogether, that's a very simple change you can make and we can possibly look at some other agreement to accomplish that. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that I possibly can, as well as, well as Mr. Rothfeder and Mr. Remington are here for questions. Oh, she's got her hand up. Ms. Myers. Yes, uh, where is uh, the clause uh, regarding the 75% uh, of the uh, rental going back to the parking facility? That's section 6G as in George. Thank you. Yep. Right. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank the council for uh, allowing me the opportunity to uh, be part of this negotiation. Um, this was a historic day in the city of Pensacola that we had negotiations open in the public, and uh, I took this responsibility very seriously. Um, I think we have a very good deal here. I, um, I'm very excited about this being the first project, private project that's going to be developed across the street. Um, we've got uh, 100 or so employees that are going to move into this new building. Um, this will be the first by the apple at, that, uh, at the park and uh, private development. I'm very excited about it. And uh, I'm, I'm encouraging this council to, to approve this deal. Um, it, uh, I, I will uh, Mr. Spears uh, mentioned uh, the Hicksar deal earlier that, that came before us on the CRA, an update with the Hicksar deal. Uh, let me remind this council and all the citizens in the audience that that, that piece of property we offered um, to, to Mr. Hicksar to help him with that deal, that, that uh, there was no, uh, uh, no, no land lease, no price that he had to pay, that that property was offered to bring those jobs. Uh, the students have, have asked for no incentives. Another deal that, that we, we talk about often is the hatchery across the street, and that's on Bruce Beach. That waterfront property was offered for this hatchery for a dollar a year. Again, the students did not ask for, for any considerations as that. We have other tax abatement projects in the, in the community that, uh, that uh, 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 entities come to us and ask us for tax abatement. None were asked for by the Studer group. I think that that's very uh, noteworthy that, uh, that we have uh, uh, the students come forth and have asked for none of these incentives that others have. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not raining on those. I think that uh, they're important as we, we uh, try to uh, uh, go after efforts and economically develop our, uh, our city. But um, again, none of those um, were, were uh, asked for and, uh, and we haven't done any of that. So I'm, I'm real excited about that. Um, I'm, I'm also uh, feel very comfortable about the numbers. The numbers, uh, we probably have some real estate professionals in the audience today, but the numbers I've ran by um, some other folks in our city, in our community, and they feel very comfortable about those numbers. Myself, I also hold a real estate uh, license uh, here locally, and, and uh, uh, my research, I think that these are fair numbers. You know, it's got to be a win-win for the city of Pensacola, the CMPA, the students, for all of us. It can't uh, be a one-sided deal, and I don't think we have a one-sided deal. I think we have a deal that will work for everyone that will benefit this community, that will bring employees down to downtown Pensacola to eat, drink, and uh, enjoy downtown. Um, I'm extremely excited about this deal, and I encourage my city council, my fellow city council members, to approve this deal today, and let's move forward. And again, it's been a very pleasure working with, uh, with all parties, um, and I'm just extremely excited about this deal and ready to move forward. And as I've said before, I'm ready to see some dirt pushed around across the street. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, and I'd like to thank Mr. Spears for his mm. meticulous presentation of this. You made it very easy to follow, and I think the citizens really appreciate that. 
um, because this is such a huge consideration that we're being asked to do. And I'd also like to thank Councilman Johnson for the time that you spent negotiating this out in the open and ensuring that the citizens' needs were addressed. Um, and I thank you for that as well. And I also thank Mr. Studer uh, every time I see him for his patience in this process and for his commitment to our community and most importantly, his faith in the people that live here. And um, I just can't be more proud of someone that is a transplant that uh, truly in his heart calls this home. And I just think it's a, it's a huge investment in our community, something that um, he didn't ask for anything in return, like Councilman Johnson has said. And I'm, I'm proud to see this moving forward. And I look forward to approving it today. Thank you. And I'll just add to that that he probably could have moved the student group downtown much more cheaply somewhere <laughs> else than building over there. Uh, Mr. Gunther. Uh, we're oh. not. Uh, Thank you, well, Mr. Chairman, members I'll of council. Finished. I'll speak after he does. Okay, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Fred Gunther. I'm a member of the CMPA Operations and Audit Committee. And I just wanted to provide a little more information, you know, on the lease you'll be voting on today. Uh, my committee, which in, includes Councilman Johnson, uh, spent you know over three hours looking at this lease last week or uh, just under three hours and I think we you know all overwhelmingly want Mr. Studer to come downtown it's a big win for everybody uh, the, the major concern with the lease uh, uh, all other terms were acceptable was the was the parking and to provide the 200 parking spaces elsewhere on the site you know I've been a, a long time supporter of the park it wasn't you know, long ago that people opposed to the park were saying, you know, it's nothing more than a stadium and a big parking lot over there. And, you know, folks like myself said, you know, that's just temporary. That's, you know, there's going to be private development there. We spent, you know, a million dollars on design guidelines. It's going to be an urban environment with structured parking wrapped in mixed use development. Uh, you know, the problem with that is, uh, you know, the, the, the parking experts that I'm talking to, uh, professionals, are saying that uh, a 200 space parking structure will cost between $12,000 and $15,000 a space. So you're basically looking at, you know, you're either looking at an obligation, you're either going to ignore the design guidelines and move forward and leave it a structured parking, you know, leave it a surface parking lot, or you need to make the obligation to spend the money to build a structured parking deck and you need to set aside that money. Um, you know, certainly if they, if they paid, uh, you know, $100,000 a year uh, over that 55 year term, that's quite a bit, but they also have that right to pay the net present value, which if they were to pay, basically pay all those, you know, those lease, all those lease monies in advance, it, I don't remember the exact, I only think we came up with an exact number, but it's somewhere around a million four, maybe even less. So, you know, in effect, you are, you know, trading an obligation, you know, basically a payment of 1.4 million for an obligation of between two and a half and three million. Um, so, I think, you know, to, to basically go back to what Councilman Johnson said, I think we would be better off giving him the land uh, for one dollar for the 55 years rather than creating this obligation, uh, you know, going forward. And, you know, the CMPA currently has a huge def deficit in its operating budget. You know, there's no money being set aside to provide parking in the future. You know, and, there, and our, even in our committee, there's a lot of discussion you know, is this the CMPA's obligation or is the city's obligation? But the reality is, you know, there's only there's there's only one source uh, to, to. I mean, there's only a couple things that could fix this budget problem, and they are reducing the fees that the city charges us for maintenance and management and that kind of thing, or to try to get more money out of Northwest Florida professional baseball. Um, you know, if we don't balance the budget, you know, there, if there was some sort of a default, I mean, it is a big problem for the city. So I think that the, the, the council should view the CMPA's obligations as the city's obligations. I mean, they're, they're completely intertwined. So, um, you know, the Operations and Audit Committee recommendation, which passed unanimously, what to, was to approve the land lease but to withhold the parking pending balancing the CMPA budget. Um, you know, unfortunately, this recommendation was never actually read to the board, and what ended up being passed was 
the lease be approved subject to the parking facilities fee, you know, being 75% of the rent that comes in. You know, the Maritime Place team has stated several times they have a site plan which provides 110 spaces on their site. Um, you know, and so that would, if they're going to, you know, need 200 spaces, that would only require an another 90. I think it would have made more sense to try to negotiate, uh, you, you know, for 90 spaces rather than provide an additional 200. Um, that would be something that would be more doable with the income, um, you know. I, anyway, so I'm basically here to make sure council is aware, you know, that approving this lease is also basically a decision to either ignore the design guidelines and keep a surface parking there a lot there all, long term, or it's an obligation to spend between two and a half and three million dollars on a surface parking lot. Um, you know, and you know, since you're aware of that, you know, I can clear my conscience. I'll leave it, you know, in your capable hands. I I wanted to make sure you're aware of it. Um, you know, if there is no willingness by council to, to hold up this approval today, I would a just ask that a member of council make a motion to approve the lease subject to this parking facilities fee being placed in a separate account that only be used for maintenance and construction of additional parking if we put $75,000 a year away, you know, in 20 years or so, we would have probably enough money to put down on a loan to build a structured parking deck at least it wouldn't be a a problem you know a, a surface parking lot out there for 55 years so um thank you very much for your time okay i've got miss myers dr pratt and uh, i just had a question for mr okay. gunther i don't know all right if they sure were uh, uh, let, uh, i'll go last mr gunther sure yeah sure. Uh, just for clarification, Lee, yeah. um, in the drawings I had seen and understood, and I wasn't party to this whole negotiation, was that that surface lot could have a parking structure built above it eventually, that it would be designed in that manner. So, Oh, oh sure. I think any any uh, of those areas out there could have a parking structure added. It was just, I, I, just so you'll know, I st spoke with Structured Parking Solutions. Uh, Greg Clawson is their sales guy, um, but that's... Mm -hmm. Uh, Ed Carson's and Adrian Lovell's group, and they're very familiar with the site. He's the one that gave me the numbers between the 12,500 to 15,000. That was for a 200 space deck. He said, you know, if it got larger, you know, maybe to like 700 spaces, you'd expect to spend between 10,000 to 12,500 a space. So that's where that information came from. Okay. And then my only other question was the suggestion that Mr. Gunther had made about uh, that income going into a specific fund. Um, would that normally be done? I don't know if Mr. Barker could just answer that or if we actually need to make that motion. It seems logical that that would be done anyway because of the way we do our accounting. Mr. Barker. Yes, sir, Mr. President and uh, Mr. Weiss. Uh, that certainly could be done. I think it... it um, it would be up to the CMPA how they, they see to use that money. Uh, they're a separate right. organization, so and, and they could make that restriction upon those funds. I guess council paying it can make an agreement with them, but you have that board there to make those type of decisions. Okay, so, so it's it, not our decision. <coughs> okay. It? Well, you're yeah. third in line here. I know Dr. Pratt does get to go before... I think you do, Mr. Johnson. I was she has not spoken yet. Yeah. I was going to address yeah, I'm going to let her said. go first. Okay. Well, I'm just going to have to go in some sort of order here. <laughs> Dr. Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, first, I'd like to start with um, my appreciation to Mr. Studer and to particularly Mr. Remington for being very responsive. I, I, um, I knew all the negotiation was going on, but I didn't engage until I saw the document and, and started asking some questions. And I s sent over some stuff, and by the time I got around to asking about it, he's like, it's already in there. So yeah, I, I appreciate that um, positive response um, to, um, to my questions. And um, I had a few other questions, though. Um, I just would like some clarification on um, 6D, um, it's about the CAM fees, and it says um, expenses um, related to private improvements, including but not limited to common area landscaping, ad valorem real property taxes, etc. I was just wondering what ad valorem real property taxes um, are part of the CAM fees. Uh, 
I just wasn't sure why that was in there. Uh, Ms. Pratt, thank you for your kind words and thank you for engaging with us. I'd also like to thank Mr. Johnson for participating in those open negotiations and the CMPA. It was really a unique process and a team effort from all involved. The <clears throat> specific language you're referring to comes right out of the MOU. <clears throat> we just literally copied and pasted it. I think it's always our hope that these would be considered public areas, not subject to ad valorem taxation. However, as soon as you tag them with private area maintenance, then they could be subject to taxation. One of the conditions that we've asked be put in the ground lease was that all public areas be surveyed, platted, and dedicated before the commencement date of the lease with the expressed hope that those public areas would not be subject to ad valorem taxation and we wouldn't get into that quandary. Okay. However, to the extent there are areas that are specifically related to the private improvement parcels, just like the private improvement parcels, they may be subject to taxation. So I, that's a Chris Jones question, though, right. ultimately. But I guess <clears throat> this is not, this is ad valorem taxes that the CMPA would be liable for, but your building will pay its own ad valorem taxes. Okay. Right. Um, and then um, I had another issue that, that I had raised um, with um, Mr. Remington um, is I went back to the master developer agreement that, that I spent many hours reading and reading and reading. I know it's now null and void, but it was a well-written document. It was just with the wrong people. Um, but there was, an, there was a section in there that, that I always thought was, was a very well thought out idea that we understand in this, in the world that we live in that, that um, it's a lot easier, particularly as this site is, is still being developed, to rent out for office uses. But this project is, is going to be a success if it's ground floor retail. And so um, one of the things in the master development agreement was a, an incentive system for putting in uh, retail, where the lease rates are um, fluctuate with whether it's retail or office use. Um, I've spoken with Mr. Studer about this, and, and he's like, I don't want the incentives necessarily, but I view this document as almost, this is what we're going to use next time we have a private development. We're going to start with this piece of paper and edit it and change it. And so I think it might be um, beneficial to consider including some of the language from that master development agreement in this agreement, it, because it just gives flexibility for future negotiations. Actually, there are two parts, and I, I gave you guys it on a sheet of paper, and I apologize that there's no punctuation because I copied and pasted and it didn't copy the punctuation, but you can make it up. Um, anyway, the, the first part is basically saying um, the ground floor should be a retail design as opposed to office design. And then the second portion says that, um, that the uh, lease rate is variable depending on the usage, and it'll come up on an annual, um, annual basis if requested. And so it, it just provides that. I, this, I, don't, I don't do legal, um, and it's not quite, doesn't quite fit in this document, but I think that this would be a valuable part to include in there for um, when we do a future agreement with another party as well as with this agreement because we all know that you know five years it might be owned by somebody else a hurricane might come wipe it out and we're starting fresh and if we can embody our desires in this document it it would be of, of good use for the 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 city going forward and i don't know if i should make a motion or um just ask that it be considered by the, the administration, and I'll look to you for guidance on that. And I do have one other question after we get. Well, as far as guidance for me, I don't, I don't know <laughs> about that. Well, you uh, can look anywhere else, but I look yeah. to you because I address the chair. <laughs> right, uh, okay. 
Um, let's 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 get everybody's okay. questions out here at one time, and then maybe we can just hash, hash it out. Miss Myers. Yes, um, I want to thank uh, all of the uh, negotiators uh, for doing a, a great job. I did attend uh, the meetings, and uh, I was uh, the, this lease agreement has been well vetted and uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank Mr. Gunther uh, for all of his hard work and diligence and keeping on top of the CMPA financing situation that you've brought up a number of issues that certainly need to, to be addressed. Uh, I, I, su I support this, this uh, lease and I would not support uh, changing it at this point because I, I feel like that we've had plenty of opportunities to um, vet this lease, to have public input, and um, I, I don't see that there needs to be any changes to it. I would like for the public to understand, however, that as far as the parking goes, uh, if Mr. Uh, Spears, uh, item 19, uh, addresses, if you could ex explain how the parking is going to, to be used, uh, the public will have access to those 200 parking places. Uh, can, can you explain that uh, for us? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Councilwoman Myers, uh, Section 19 of the lease does... Uh, encompass the parking section and it talks to the uh, 200 spaces uh, those spaces would be designated for use by the the office building and either signage or parking decals would be um, provided to the individuals parking there that would consist basically of eight to five Monday through Friday from 5 p.m. on Monday through Friday and then at all times during the weekend both the parking lot that exists today as well as any parking that the Maritime Place LLC chooses to build would be available to the CMPA for parking for special events. And it's basically the exact same arrangement we have uh, today. There, there's no one charging for parking right now for eight to five. Anyone could park there. We're just designating those spaces for that particular use. Uh, Mr. Mr. Gunther's numbers on the preliminary assessment were, were basically right. Um, 110 spaces could be built uh, on that parcel, but if we want to maximize that, obviously it would be a temporary parking lot to be built on later. Uh, same as our surface parking lot is not a permanent structure. It was built to, to temporary standards in order to, to provide us opportunity to develop that parcel later. So basically, uh, after standard business hours, Monday through Friday, both parking lots would be available to the public. Right, and, and, I, and I, I think that's important for the public to know, to, to know that. It's not like these 200 parking places are just going to be taken away and not utilized by the the park over there uh, so uh, I just wanted to bring that up uh, so I, I do support the lease and I, I and I hope that council will support it without making any changes to it Dr. Pratt you said you had a second question yeah yeah actually two more um, first um, I was wondering if we could get an answer from someone on the 75% um, the of the lease fee going back to the CMPA, I, and I understand all the reasoning, I just didn't know how that affects the, the city's budget for the upcoming year. I assume that was, this structure was contemplated as being a, a funding source in our upcoming budget. Maybe it wasn't, maybe the lease fees don't start for another year. I just didn't know if we could get an answer on how those changes might affect our upcoming budget. Uh, Mr. Barker. Yes, sir. Mr. President and, and Ms. Pratt, uh, that was an issue, if you don't mind, that I was going to discuss today, and I discussed with Mr. Spears, discussed with Mr. Reeves, and um, uh, Mr. Gray, uh, since this came out Friday, in order to get some understanding and clarification of what, it, what <coughs> was going on, I also listened to several of the discussions that were going on with the lease. And this, this, if I recall, came out at the last meeting. And uh, I, what I would um, just like to inform council about, and uh, even suggest to council that they consider as that part of the lease is that um, since the, the amount of 75% has already been negotiated and determined, 
then it's just a matter of the source of the funds. I'm here to speak of the source of the funds. Um, it, as the lease is written, the source of the funds would be the money received uh, by the city uh, from the Studers for um, that, the, the lease of the property, which certainly brings less money into the general fund, uh, which really, as we have programmed this, the lease fees, as we discussed, would come into the um, economic development fund that we discussed creating uh, in 13, any new lease fees uh, in, for any of the parcels over there. So my suggestion would be, and you will recall this because we've discussed it before, in the CRA budget for fiscal year 12, there's $300,000 in there in anticipation that there were some issues that may occur at the park that we needed funding for. And we've discussed that before. I would suggest that uh, council consider using CRA as the funding source for the same 75%, just instead of coming from the general fund and this source of the, the lease fees, that it come from the CRA. That money is appropriated, and actually it was put in the budget uh, to deal with the uh, community maritime park. Um, and I think that gives council more flexibility. As you know, CRA funds can only be spent in the CRA area. The economic development funds could be spent anywhere within the city limits. Uh, so uh, that was one item that I came to speci specifically speak to. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, the other issues that I had um, in doing the due diligence on this, uh, there are a few changes that uh, the city's uh, new market tax expert attorney has uh, sent in uh, to us for this and also the city bond attorney i had him review it to make sure that we were in compliance i, I don't think it's anything material it's clarification of according to new market tax credits um, what uh, prohibitions uh, as far as what can go in the building as it relates to new market tax credits and that paragraph needs to be added uh, to the lease and then uh, in discussions with the city attorney uh, and my staff reviewing the agreement, there are some, some legal issues that uh, just clarifications that need to be made in the agreement. So as we've done in the past, as council will remember, I certainly think if council chooses to approve this, that it would be subject to a legal review, meaning the, the legal department, uh, Mr. Studer's uh, getting with his attorney, New Market Tax Credit attorney and the Bond Council, any comments that they had on the agreement that that would be inclusive of those. Uh, hopefully all that can be done by Thursday night and, and sent out to Council before that uh, for, for that. But should Council want to do the CRA funding, I would suggest that you take 6G out of the agreement. I don't believe Mr. Studer, that's an issue for Mr. Studer, it's really an issue for the CMPA and the city council, and if you choose to do that, that would be an item that would come back to the CRA to, to make a decision on and, and uh, sent to the CMPA. But uh, those are my only comments uh, that I have um, for council to inform them that funds were available in CRA to, to pay the fee in lieu of the general fund, and it would be more flexible to leave those funds in the general fund, but it's certainly up to city council what they'd like to do. And, and following that comment, I guess I, first I'm going to say you, you jumped to my next question was the legal review. And, and I, I know I had received various emails about uh, whether Mr. Messer would be at the CMPA and such. And I, I do want to ensure that we do have thorough legal review. But um, I know this will be a CRA thing. But um, I, I, would, I would be willing to keep that um, 6G in there. Um, we... I believe that that 300,000 is in addition to the 500,000 we loaned the CRA uh, CMPA for the back of the house and I'm I haven't seen that money uh, jumping back into our coffers so I think in the interest of the CRA we might want to consider making sure that that some of the money is spent in another part of the CRA but um, I appreciate your comments and I look forward to the legal review thank you Mr. Johnson. Yeah, thank you very much. And I, I'm, I'm, along, I'm going to ride with Ms. Uh, Dr. Pratt on that. I, I like the way that this reads right now. Um, if we need to address this later, I think that we, we can do that, the city and the CRA. Uh, as far as attorney review, um, I, uh, who, I, I guess we need to 
Uh, Mr. Messer, you're going to review this then for the city council, or do we need to make a motion to make sure that that happens? Or um, because we need legal representation right now, it is a little iffy. Um, and I just want to make sure that we are all clear that you will be representing the city council in this in this matter. Mr. Messer, yes, sir, please. I, I think it's abundantly clear that Mr. Messer will be representing the city council. <laughs> just, just want to make sure because sometimes we get in that gray area out there that that I um, sometimes can't seem to pin down when I need to pin it down. Um, so with that said, uh, I do like the way that it reads now. Um, and about the parking, too, um, I was going to comment on that, and I pre appreciate Mr. Gunther uh, with, with, with the citizens act activists as he is that, that kind of keep, keep an eye on things and, and uh, offer input that maybe we wouldn't enjoy some other time that it is appreciated, even though we might disagree for have a friendly disagreement about it. Um, you know, that's fine. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll remind everyone in the audience that, that uh, the, uh, Mr. Studer uh, and uh, Maritime Place has agreed to allow uh, that uh, after hours and uh, weekends that we will be able to enjoy um, parking revenues off, off of that, which was a very, uh, 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 I think, good consideration for the citizens and for the park. Um, there also, I want to note that there was, a, there was a, uh, uh, something put up on the screen that showed parking there next to the building, and I want to make sure everyone knows that that is, uh, that's a consideration that, uh, that, 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 that uh, Maritime Place will, will consider doing that. That's not an obligation. Um, I think that, uh, that we want to make sure that everyone knows that, uh, that that's something that might happen. It might not. Um, I have a feeling that it, it will, but, uh, but we, we, uh, we, we don't want anyone to walk away thinking there will be a parking lot next to that uh, for sure. Uh, the other thing is that the parking lot, the, the existing parking lot today is about 350 spots. So um, 200 spots there. There will still be some other parking. I know the Wahoos have some of that too, but um, but you know it's it's not we're not we're not the, the whole parking lot's not going to go away. That uh, from nine to five uh, Monday through Friday that uh, there will be parking there um, uh, spaces there that will be set aside for that office building, but not 100% of that parking is going to go away. And I, I ride by that parking lot every every uh, day just about and notice that uh, the parking lot uh, there, there there's available parking. Uh, uh, during the day and at night, hopefully we can fill that out with people attending different events there. So, again, I'd, I'd like to see G stay in there as it is. Um, I, I think that uh, the city and the CRA can work something out that's acceptable to all. But right now, I feel very comfortable about the way that it's structured, and uh, I'm ready to 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 move forward with it. Thank you. Anybody else from the committee, the audience? Oh, well, I think we're. Mr. I'd Robert. like to make a motion. We already have one. What was the motion? Uh, here. Yeah. Who's just second? Read, just re read it for me, Mr. Johnson. Let me see if I can get it to come up. Hold on a second. I have it up. You got read it. it. Go. You're quicker than me. <laughs> uh, that the City Council approve the land lease between the City and Maritime Place LLC for the development of a commercial mm -hmm. building at the Maritime Park. Second. Yeah. Yeah. We'd already had yeah. the second. Yeah. Okay. And well. It. And, and Mr. President, I will have to recuse myself from this vote. Okay. Now, every time you do this, do you have to file the paperwork? Every time. Every time. Okay. Yep. Okay. Ms. Myers. Well, I was just wondering, I mean, if, it, uh, if we approve this, then is there a need for the city attorney to review it? I mean, if the city attorney is going to review it for legal, should we not approve it subject to the city attorney reviewing it for, for legal? We can do the. I, I, I'll I accept can, that as a friendly amendment. Yeah, there yeah. you go. And, All right. And because it, it's not final until Thursday night anyway, so. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Yes. With that amendment to the motion? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All, right. All in favor, please raise your hands. That passes unanimously with one abstention. Okay. Thank you. And I appreciate Thank that you. disclosure from Mr. Spencer, too. I hope that we have that more often at the CRA, too, here. As we spoke about earlier. <laughs> All right. We can't do it. <laughs> Mr. Reynolds, you're on. Sorry, I had to. Mr. Dr. Wu, would I be able to get you to move up here with me, please, so that if I have to, to, to leave to go to the, a rest break, that you could help me chair? Uh, Thank you, Mr. President. At this time, uh, 
we'd like to take a look at uh, item number, formerly known as item number 11, uh, restoring downtown Pensacola's historic grid, street grid, reconnecting East Government Street, West Florida Regional Planning Council presentation by Regional Planner 2, Alan Gray, AICP. Alan, it's all yours. <laughs> How are you, sir? Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Council, I believe you also have a, a piece of your packet that details um, this final report. If you'll follow along with me, I have some visual aids that are set up among the room. They're sort of halfway designed for us to see because you have these in front of you, but there is one graphic that is at the top left. That is not among the uh, report packet. So let me begin. Um, my name is Alan Gray, and I work with the West Florida Regional Planning Council. Uh, I've been an urban planner there for a number of years, and uh, that is correct. I do have an AICP designation, which is about a 10-year endeavor, roughly. Um, but we have been tasked with the city of Pensacola to take a look at something that originated, well, the reason we're here originated five months ago, almost to the day, but truly the, the nature of the issue at hand probably began about 35 years ago and really culminated in something 30 years ago, um, which inspired the name of the project uh, that we gave it, which was Restore the Grid. Um, the city, five months ago, March 19th, in the Committee of the Whole, um, it, was, it was obvious that the city needed to do some um, some public invol involvement meetings. And as a result of that, there was a motion on this, in this committee, to conduct those public involvement meetings. Um, about two months from that point forward, about the end of May, an agreement was hammered out between the, the Planning Council, which um, we are open for any agreement like this to occur between any of our municipalities in the district, um, without any bid process. It's our designated function, actually, to assist local governments with technical issues such as this. And, uh, and the city um, and the planning council developed a plan to actually conduct these, these public involvement meetings. It was, um, it was our plan to conduct four meetings, and they would occur on the 6th of July, the 12th of July, the 19th of July, and the 26th of July. The nature of those meetings was a, a morphing nature. The, uh, the original meeting, which, was, which occurred on the 6th of July, uh, two days after a holiday, was a long three-hour meeting, but it was really a, uh, a 101 of what planners consider the tenets of complete streets and what, what sort of um, uh, we, we sort of look to when we, we define a, a street as a complete street. It was, it was, we were really lucky to catch this break, but we actually were able to get uh, a national transportation expert in the name of uh, Dan Burden along our, on, our, on our team here to actually work with uh, the folks that were in attendance at that meeting. I think I had 69 of the tenants. I didn't sign in, and I know Dan Burden didn't sign in, so we had 71 folks in this room right here and we, uh, we went through uh, a presentation that I started with, which is sort of a history lesson, and then his presentation, which was very much a, um, uh, the, the brass tacks of, uh, of what is a complete street, what's a safe neighborhood, what's walkability, what's livability. Um, again, that meeting was almost three hours. It didn't end with just the presentation. We had a good hour and 10 minutes devoted to um, a, a q and A, I would guess it would be best to find, and that was between those in attendance and, and then the two presenters and, and there were actually a couple of fielded answers and questions with uh, elected officials at that meeting. Um, but one thing that was sort of that was notable in, in my uh, my report here, that the final report, was a few of those bullet points that you'll find on on page three, and uh, those basically were Dan's grasp <coughs> and, uh, and 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 gist from what he saw with the city of Pensacola. These are the things that he said ought to happen if you are going to have a complete street facility here. Um, I'll let you read those, but, but essentially they were to drop those speeds. It was to shrink that road, get it, get it to 11 feet wide, put some bicycle facilities out there, and let's get the street to meet ADA standards when it comes to sidewalks and accessibility for those that are, um, those that are, uh, that are um, have, you know, having, uh, what's the term? They're, they're, they, they require the ADA to get around. Um, and at this point, I want to just let you guys know there's a fantastic set of resources for you out there. You don't have to just stop at the presentation today. 
Um, anyone can Google the term complete streets. And in fact, there's a couple other good resources out there. I think one that's uh, brought to my attention recently was an 8 to 80. It's 8 80.org. Right. And what that, what that means is you, you develop a community that's safe for an 80 year old individual or an 8 year old individual to, to work inside that, in that community, and you've got yourself a successful community. And that just means that we've got safety and we've got accessibility in mind when we look at a new facility or when we look at a facility we want to improve. So that was really uh, a good summary of what happened in that first meeting. You can look on page five, and the folks in the room here can look at the, uh, the center bottom two images on those graphics there and see what we call a cross-section. This is basically a snapshot looking down the barrel of a street. And in that cross-section, you can see we've got some lines and some measurements going on there. And then below that, or actually above that on these, these sideboards, you can see a rendering, a rendering that was actually donated for free by a, is it Carter? Keenan Grundhofer. Keenan Grundhofer, thank you so much. I have a terrible time with that. Keenan Grundhofer Architects uh, donated the time of one of their uh, newer staff who's actually moved on, uh, but, but her sort of swan song in Pensacola were, uh, were, were these uh, renderings you see here on the, on the uh, that one's not, that one's not uh, Alexandra. But these other uh, renderings, the, the sort of the, the pastel color renderings were her, were her work. They were the, uh, the graphics developed at the end of this meeting. Um, but you can see in, in your, on page five uh, a cross section looking down the street, and we just show that the, uh, the facility has some room to uh, shrink. And when you shrink it, what are you going to get when you do? And so we looked at larger sidewalks, additional green space. It was discussed earlier about using a, um, a bicycle lane, which has got to be about five feet. But uh, the group that we had together with us was looking, uh, was looking more along the lines of let's have some more green space on that street. And uh, so the, the thoughts were some nice ADA sidewalks, six foot <coughs> on the side, two feet of green space, about eight feet of parking structures, and then you've got your, your um, automobile facility in the center. All that would fit within the facility we have on, uh, on East Government Street. We're going to move forward to the next meeting, which was uh, only about 50 people came to this meeting but it was on the, the 12th. Um, this was the first chance that we had our, 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 our meeting groups to go into these things that we named task forces. The task forces covered three major topics. The three major topics were the, um, the automobile access, and that means automobile access to the district, um, pedestrian, <coughs> well, I'm sorry, livability and walkability, and then we had a third group called design, and they sort of handled the issues brought up in either one. They were sort of your, your jack of all trade group. And in fact, the design group was who came up with these final designs based on the inputs gathered at the uh, livability, walkability, automobile access groups. Um, you can see some of the outputs of that. Uh, there's uh, one graphic here that I thought was pretty interesting. We, the groups came up with an idea of raised intersections. Anyone seen a raised crosswalk? It's where you kind of, your car will roll over a crosswalk and come back down it. Um, the thought was that a whole raised intersection, paved to look like paving or whatever that would be, up to an engineer, but the idea would be that the automobile would treat that intersection with much greater respect and would actually slow down and traverse that in a much slower pace, giving the pedestrian or anyone on a bicycle or someone pushing a stroller in a wheelchair a much better chance of traversing that street, getting across it. So the, the idea there was, was developed early on in those meetings. Um, there's another cross-sectional diagram. It's on the top of this. But again, you can see as a group, they've decided not to use a bicycle lane facility, so this is kind of an outmoded graphic, but it was a graphic that was developed earlier on in the process. I thought it worthwhile because it gives you a better rendition than, than uh, this actual image, an actual image, so I've included it. Then we get to the 19th of July. We only had about 40 folks there. Um, at this meeting, we started to, to hone in and distill the ideas that were among the different groups. And by that, I mean, at the end of the meeting, we sort of got together, we heard all the the presentations of the special topic groups and developed sort of a, I don't know what you call it, a, a, a list of priorities <coughs> or common opinions. At that meeting, the, the common opinions are listed on page 13. Um, they have uh, the titles livability, walkability, automobile, and design. You can also see an additional graphic here. It's on the bottom right corner of our posters here, but it's also on page 14 for you folks. And that is a, um, a bird's eye view of Government Street. It's from Alconese and one block to the east. Anybody know what's that street just east of Alconese? Florida Blanca. Is it Florida Blanca? So you're looking at uh, a bird's eye view from Florida Blanca to Alconese and Florida Blanca of uh, East Government Street. And you can see a lot of the ideas we're talking about here. This is an extreme road diet. 
the automobiles have 22 feet where they just about had, well, I'd say four or five feet extra per, per lane. They've only got 22 feet to work with. You can see pull out, put out, well, they're called well, bulb outs, but they're effectively where the curb comes way out into the street and it, it harbors a parking spot. Or it, it, it enables the, uh, the crosswalk to be a much shorter distance across the street by bulbing out towards the intersection. But you can see a lot of the facilities described there. Uh, let me move to the, uh, the, the last meeting we had, which is on the 26th of July. And um, in this meeting, we had about 48 sh folks show up. We had a, a revised, uh, well, we had an agenda we had to revise. We were planning to get our, our expert, the, the national expert, Dan Burden, back among us. But uh, I guess PC will, will feel him on this one. He couldn't get his uh, Skype system to work on his computer from where he was. So we had to um, drop that from the agenda. So we, we, we thought we would have about 10 minutes where Dan Burden could actually present and then stay along with us throughout the meeting. We didn't have any access to that, uh, that at all. So what we did was we took a look at the findings from the last meeting, which was on the 19th. And uh, we basically went through that list. And I think we developed probably within about 10 minutes a system whereby we would use hand votes of the group in attendance and find out what we thought was a good piece to go on and present to you folks here at Committee of the Whole and what was something they wanted to change before we, you know, had our last sort of say. <coughs> And I, and I will say that there was, um, there was a lot of stuff that did change this last meeting. And I think the graphic that I've provided on the last page, it is not up here. But on the, on the graphic that you have on page 17, you basically see the, uh, the essence of what, what, what happened was we did a lot of work on uh, developing some scenarios. And essentially, we cut those scenarios down to there doesn't need to be any access to this district for the automobile. Any additional, I'm, I'm sorry, the term additional was used. And that includes, and I'm going to try to use the pointer, but it's not going to work. That includes Florida Blanca. That includes a pedestrian access point at Zaragoza. You're okay. And that includes also the, um, you know, the, the intersection at Ninth Bayfront and East Government. So all those ideas were, were removed from the table. But um, let me do some service to the groups that met before that day and just say that there was a, an interesting idea. And, and you can see it presented on this top right-hand corner uh, image. It's also in your, it's in your packet. It's on, excuse me one second, it's on page 15. And what you can see here is a, a little shift from what was discovered back when Gendros had this football in his hand. And that was that there may not need to be a, uh, a roundabout. I know you see a little roundabout feature there, and I'll explain what that is. That little donut's not a roundabout. But you'll see what happens here is, is that the street, South Ninth, is communicating much further to the east than it traditionally does today. You can also see there's some brickwork, or rendering of brickwork here and brickwork here. That's at Zaragoza and that's at Florida Blanca. That represents a pedestrian access point crosswalk. That represents pedestrian raised intersection as well as a, a street light facility at the bottom of Florida Blanca. And then if you can see it, it's not terribly clear here, but you can see East Government actually functioning with a dog leg, I guess is the term, onto Bayfront Parkway. And the reason that the group that was there, the, the 19th, felt that that was possible was because of the geometry change with South Ninth Avenue. By taking South Ninth Avenue and pushing it 200 feet to the east, they felt that it was safe to actually communicate East Government with Bayfront Parkway, not Ninth Avenue, but with Bayfront Parkway. And then another communication for pedestrians only at Zaragoza, pedestrians and um, automobiles at Florida Blanca. Let me tell you kind of why that was an interesting idea. The interesting idea about it was what it did to Bayfront Parkway. And a lot of the, the idea of this meeting was to come and talk about East Government, Ninth, and Bayfront. But the truth was, the conversations didn't just end there. They spilled out into different areas. And Bayfront Parkway was a big topic. It was essentially stated that, the, the, as a group consensus, that the, that the thing is just like an expressway, and they feel it's not a very good neighbor. Um, I don't think that's news to anyone here. But some of the ideas that could make this road communicate a little bit better with its neighborhood adjacent would be to actually calm the traffic there. So we talk about traffic calming, and that was an idea to actually traffic calm Bayfront Parkway. Um, you do this with adding, you know, interest points such as trees. You bring those closer to the edge of the street, and you add points where other roads communicate with it. And that's what we show here is a, I guess you want to say the word ultimate, but this is a demonstration of ultimate communication. This is not a highly popular rendition. 
according to this group. I will let you know that, that this right here, this top right, was not highly favored in the 19th, wasn't highly favored at all on the 26th, but was one group's design group had a couple members that thought this might be a solution, so we rendered it. But let me also tell you about another facility here. That thing that looks like a donut at the top on your page is actually what you see rendered here at the bottom right center, I'm sorry, center right, and that was a pedestrian gateway. This pedestrian gateway was really something that came to fruition at these meetings, so it was a bunch of people putting their heads together. I think we have several of them in, in the room came together and said, you know, we should make a, you know, sort of a grand entryway for bike, bike and pedestrian. So that's the facility you see there in that extra space you kind of buy when you move 9th Street over into Admiral Mason Park's area. As you sort of buy some space there, you can do whatever you want with it, and, uh, and you see rendered here the pedestrian gateway. So it's a pretty interesting idea to actually have one gateway for the, uh, the pedestrians and bicycle uses to go into that park and come from the park in and enjoy the district, but it also, it didn't, it didn't have to happen with the, uh, the additional access on East Government. You didn't have to have East Government touching Bayfront to have that, that thing work and make some sense. But I wanted to render it with both on that one, just to show you guys what it was and, and let that be that. But you can see a very detailed, and this is also another piece that was, uh, um, we didn't pay for that. The, the people that showed up figured out a way to have that done for us, and it's, uh, it's a really nice looking facility. So what we're basically showing you <clears throat> Is, is, is at the end of this thing, I think we have really three clear possibilities, options, scenarios, schemes that the city could go forward with. And, and let me sort of enunciate what those are separately. I'm not putting weight on any one of them. I'm just letting you know what they are. Um, I think the first option that you guys have on your, on, your, on your plate is to do nothing. And that's something that planners always like to give the elected officials as an option. Do absolutely nothing. We've, uh, we've gone through this process. We've heard the public. The public... Uh, input and uh, we consider it but we actually do nothing. The second opportunity that you have is to, let me, let me try to read this out, is to uh, provide connectivity to the district, I'm sorry, to make some pedestrian improvements to the street but do not restore a connection of East Government Street to 9th Avenue or Bayfront Parkway. We always talk about 9th Avenue but as you can see the, the, the scenarios here really talk about a communication with Bayfront Parkway, not 9th Avenue. Um, you can see the geometry there is very difficult it's a matter of angles and, 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 and other such things that roundabouts don't really serve three facilities at varying angles. They typically serve two crossroads. They don't typically serve these weird angles, typically. But um, scenario two, let me rephrase it, is, uh, is to communicate uh, no automobile accessibility between Government Street, 9th Avenue, or Bayfront Parkway. But it could include the creation of a pedestrian gateway in the middle of the terminus of East Government Street. Um, and, and that had a lot of strong support with the, uh, the folks that were at the meetings. Uh, that was it, clearly the last two meetings was when it was uh, the, the sort of the seeds for this really came. And uh, we had some renderings that we could take a look at. But those really were, had a lot of following with the group that was there. Um, and let me tell you about uh, a third option, which is um, ultimate connectivity. And um, I think you'll find that this one has uh, a few differences from option number two and obviously a lot of differences from option number one. This would be to um, provide connectivity for um, automobiles, pedestrians, bicyclists, transit modes of transportation, and, um, and all of this would be open to East Government, Florida Blanca, um, some pedestrian facility here at, at uh, Alcanese, I'm sorry, at Zaragoza. Um, but it would require quite a few things to happen on those streets as a re recommendation of those groups earlier was that uh, they, they absolutely said if, if you guys plan or would like to open up the communication of an automobile to East Government. They asked that you make some of the improvements that we had talked about in here. Um, bring, those, bring those first and then communicate the, the traffic onto the street. And those were basically a lot of the traffic calming. The ideas of complete streets really add a lot of calming features to a street. Um, you've seen those rendered in those, uh, the renderings that we have. Um, the, the biggest ideas are right here in the very center of the page, which is to calm the traffic, make it uh, safe for the pedestrian and, and, the, uh, and the folks that have businesses and homes there. So if you could take a look at that last page, you'll see all those bullet points that basically talk about what you'd have to do if you were to take option three. Those bullet points um, really take most of what Dan Burden was saying. Actually, they take a heck of a lot of stuff, what uh, Ray Gendros was saying, and bring them in. And, um, and those aren't cheap things. But anything this group will tell you, they will also tell you, I said, guys, I don't want you to think about how much money we have. I want you to think about what you want and then let's, let's, let's sort of 
sky, blue sky the thing and figure out what we can do, and then let's, let's communicate to the city what we really want. So again, these improvements, while costly, while uh, could take years to pay off, would be um, what are part of recommend, or recommendation number three, which would also include you know, the communication of the automobile. Um, let me lastly get to um, the last page of this, of this um, final report to the city, and that is to say um, we had some areas where we thought there could be some improvements with this, um, with this process. Um, first of all, we think it's fantastic that the city thought to do some public involvement with this group here. As just a planner, I'm saying that to you, I think the city residents in the area felt good about having a platform to be heard and then knowing that we're going to come in front of the city, which, which we're still going to do here. I think in a moment and, uh, and letting you guys know what they feel. So um, we thought there'd be one more thing that you probably could do that would be advisable. Let me go and put you back at the very front of the project on page, I'm sorry to do this, on page two. And there's a graphic there that details what I think is a pretty good relevant geography for doing a survey. And I think the city, I would, I would love for you guys to take this one and, and run it the way you think, but I've boundaried the city the, the area of interest as being everything along Bayfront Parkway from 9th Avenue all the way to Alconies, up to the buildings that front along Palafox, um, that front along East Government, all the way to Palafox up, and then all the buildings that front the north side of Palafox. Then I think at uh, Alconies you go north all the way to Ramana, and you cut over one block. At the beginning of Aragon, you include the neighborhood of Aragon. At uh, 9th Avenue, you drop all the way down to the intersection of 9th and, uh, and uh, Bayfront. I think that's a pretty good ge geography of folks that you want to find that are going to be directly impacted by any change you make, uh, should you make one in this area. But I'm absolutely open to anything the city wants to do as far as expanding that. This is about 450 to 480 addresses, businesses and residents, renters and owners. And what I think would be advisable, I've included in your packet, is a, is, a, is a particular survey. I believe it's nine questions, and it offers an area for you to comment as an individual. And, er, and, and, and it gives you an area where to comment what are the three most important improvements for the city that you would make for your neighborhood. But I would, uh, I would think it would be good for you as elected officials to actually know what the, the folks in this area think. Um, we've done a, I think we've done a pretty good job with four meetings and communicating with this report what the folks in this area thought, the ones that were willing to spend 10 hours with me in a room. Um, over the, the course of that month. We know what they think, but I think it's also important to know what the, the remainder of that district thinks. And, um, and again, I, I, I try to do a job, um, and that was to bring forth their information to give it to you, but I don't want to do it alone. I had two individuals, if you'll allow me, uh, that wanted to read the last findings of the last meeting. Um, they're, in the, they're in the audience behind me, and if you'll allow me, uh, Mr. President, I would like to bring them up and have them read. Um, I think it's about... I think it's about 12 bullet points. Would okay, sure. Okay? Would that be okay? Thank you so much. <laughs> I was the chair of the automobile subgroup, and part of our findings, we found for connectivity, the downtown neighborhood, as shown in that outline, has eight or ten, eight or nine, nine or ten points of entry into the neighborhood. We thought that was a good number. Additional entry was not needed. Uh, we like mini circles. We thought, what street do we like? We like Romana. Romana looks good. It's got lower speed limits. It has a mini circle when the traffic comes in. We liked the mini circle, and we'd like one on Savalos and East Government. Uh, we liked 15 to 20 mile an hour speed limits. Those. You might not approve, but we said what we like. Uh, trees in the parking areas. To make it a green space, to make green out of the street so that it's not a throughway, move the trees into the parking space. You can gain parking by siding, sizing the parking spaces according to what our planner told us so that you can fit the same number of spaces with um, markings. We said we didn't want a bus stop, but that's because there's a bus stop on um, Romana and we were implementing, we were re redoing Romana and so we just said we didn't want the bus stop. We wanted it to look like that without the bus stop. The cross section should include six foot sidewalks, two feet of green space, eight feet of parking, then 11 foot lanes. We decided we didn't need the bicycle lane because uh, 
when I speak in a moment, there's only about 415 cars going one way and 485 cars going the other way on that part of Alkenes. So we felt the traffic didn't require a specific lane for bicycles and we use it for green space. Another presenter that's um, that's not good. Would it be Miss Regan? Oh, good. No, not good. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm here uh, to report for the neighborhood uh, a neighborhood group the report that we have to offer you uh, also in addition to Mr. Gray's report, and I'll report later on. <laughs> not as they were supposed to because be able to. this is not a report as part of Mr. Gray's report. Okay. May I speak one more? I'll be back again. I'll raise my hand and ask for your recognition to speak again I just, in that regard. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, I'd just like to get a show of hands out here. How many people are in the audience for this issue tonight? Whether you're for or against it? Whether you're for or against it. Whether you're for or against it, right? Well, that Okay. Now, how many here are against opening Government Street in tonight? Okay, and how many are for um, opening Government Street and tonight? Could you ask how many are property owners, please? Ask how many are property owners. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, how many are property owners then? Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. Ms. Myers. I would also la like to ask if there's anybody on city council who has any interest in any property in on Government Street in the area. I don't own. I rent an office on Government Street. Okay, and where is your office? Um, just to the west of Alconies and Government Street. So it's in, is it in the area we're discussing tonight? East uh, per the survey part, I mean, mm -hmm. it's mostly mm -hmm. to the east okay. of Alconies. Does anyone else on council have any interest in any property on Government Street? I've been paying property taxes on some East Government Street property for about 20 years. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, look, in the 200 block, but is, is that an issue? Well, I think that if anyone on city council has uh, an interest in uh, East Government Street, any interest at all, whether they, especially if they own property or have an interest, then it should be disclosed. I mean, okay. we've been disclosing everything else tonight appropriately, so I right. just okay. uh, I wanted to bring it up because somebody uh, else uh, brought uh, it up. So you, you wanted it as far as disclosure, but not to, to disqualify somebody from voting? Correct. Okay, okay. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, I appreciate that disclosure. Hopefully we'll have that um, from uh, on the CRA issue when uh, someone represents uh, a business there and also represents them privately uh, in their private practice when they're a part-time contract employee here. Um, moving away from that, um, we talked about uh, uh, 450 to 480. Um, you, was that businesses and residents that you have rec uh, recognized in, in this, this uh, particular area? Yeah, um, I asked your PIO, Derek Cosson, to produce a list for me of the addresses within the geography I've described here to the City Council. And uh, he just gave me an Excel sheet. The, the bottom of the Excel sheet stops at 4, it's in the 450, 60, something like that, almost okay. to 480. But it does not distinguish between an address that is a business or an address that is a resident. It is a similar thing at all cases. It's just an address. That, that's what I just wanted to make sure that I understand. So it, it, it's, it, it's a business or an address. Yeah. And if there's a survey sent out, I thought you said that you would recommend to us sending a survey out? I do. Okay. So one, one address would get one survey that would be filled out by all persons. How would that work? For, um, walk me through that, Mr. Gray. Would you... Would someone allow me the uh, an additional agenda piece? Because the uh, the survey actually has some specific questions that would um, be of very high interest to someone who's in the the planning. So, but what one address would have yeah, all the persons answer once put right. it back in their mailbox, and at no charge, it goes back to the city. That tabulation is done, and then a report could be provided based on that information collected from the survey itself. But the survey does ask questions like, from this address, how many trips are originated or to and from this this address every day. Things like that are, are asked. So there's in generic, the, the questions were asked to be generic and specific to a household or a business equally. The, the, the survey actually, the, the, the whole survey is in your packet there tonight. 
Okay. You should yeah. be able to see that. It's maybe a two or three pages after. Right. Um, I haven't had a see chance. A, uh, a flashy kind of flyer. That was my come to the meeting flyer. Page and then after that, there should be a survey oh, written in landscape. Okay. Is that is that available there, sir? Uh, yeah, she yeah, says it is. So it probably is. Okay. She's a lot more computer the, literate than I. The survey was designed for a one address receives it and one address submits it. That was the design of it. Okay, thank you. I, I might have questions later. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Gray. Okay. Anybody else in council? I did have a question yes. just on that, um, and I have comments later. On this survey, um, and I'm trying to pull up a map, and it came up very small, but that you have the historic district, and then you have the downtown business district, which are two completely different oh, okay, um, districts. There's different parking plans that, you know, there's free parking over by Seville Square. It's more of a neighborhood setting. And then going towards Palafox is more business. So is there a reason that other than just being on Government Street that you're combining those considerations? Because I think that's two completely separate conversations about what the needs of that part of the community are. Um, yeah, thank you for the question, if I may answer. Sure. Um, I based the, uh, the district that I was going to include for the flyer that was at the back of your packet here tonight on who I thought was most impacted. And I included individuals and businesses that I felt most impacted all along East Government Street, and I just sort of cut it off at Palafox. I felt Palafox has got enough distance and it's able to commu freely communicate with other facilities mm -hmm. where, um, where I just drew the line. That said, that's probably a pretty good boundary. This is, again, outside the specific CRA district, which is the historic downtown. I felt that that extension you see there to the west was important. I also extended it to the north through Aragon, and the reason I did that is because of the concept of adjacent facilities. The adjacent facility of Romana Street picks up a lot of what East Government does not provide. Mm -hmm. It no longer provides it as it did in 1979. So that was why I picked up Romana Street. So I just said, you know what? Both sides of Romana Street, why not? And I picked up Aragon completely as a neighborhood. I stopped that at, um, at uh, Florida, Florida Blanca, and then I stopped the south side at Alcanese mm -hmm. when, you, when I was talking about surveying that group. So this is the group I chose to survey, but I would absolutely enjoy and, and would love for city to, mm -hmm. to, to make some recommendations as to where this particular survey would be delivered to. Um, again, I recommend the city pick up the dime on putting together a mail out and then also do the staff time of, of analyzing. We've kind of fulfilled all needs of our contract at this point. So I would recommend the city, if you, if you folks would, please recommend a geography. Mm -hmm. Again, I put, uh, I put my considerable um, uh, attention on this one for a while. I really I fraught over it and I felt this was the way to go. Mm -hmm. If you folks feel that it needs to be smaller, tighter, larger, please let me know and or please, please decide. Because this was, this was when it was in my hands. This is what I thought was a mm -hmm. built of geography. And then the only other question is that if we did do a survey like this, and this is something for all of us to, to consider, I guess, is what weight that is given. If there's traffic studies that are absolutely definitive, these are the amount of cars on certain roadways that exist right now. Um, I wasn't uh, involved in the in-depth conversations. I've been in touch with many people, both for and against. and. My concern is, is that there is a neighborhood that um, absolutely does not want this. There are some businesses that would like to have this, but it's not a must-have. They're already thriving businesses, so uh, the people that want to get to them know how to get to them. Um, and I'll have more comments on that later. I look forward to hearing from the the property owners in the in the historic district, but. If we have this survey from everyone in whatever boundaries we set, and then we have definitive traffic studies that, that show something completely different, how are we going to resolve that? Are we just creating another um, huge conversation that we can't resolve? <laughs> so I don't know that, that I'm trying to understand what it would accomplish. Mr. Gray. I might like to point out to this top left graphic, it's horribly represented in this small manner, but in this top left, gra left graphic, right. there are the traffic count data that were collected as a, as a result of some of these concerns that were brought forth at the second meeting. Okay. Um, it was promised that we would get some of this data out to the group's automobile access as well as uh, the, the walkability, livability. Mm -hmm. If you look at anything east of, uh, of Alkanes on East Government itself, we got a traffic count of 889. And that's uh, 400 and some going one way, 400 and some going the other way. It's pretty balanced. But that's 400 and some traffic 
eastbound, let's say, and 400 some traffic westbound per day. It's an average annual daily trip, or average daily trip, ADT. If you look at, well, let's go about a block to the, uh, the east of the front doors of Seville, it's 2,100 trips per day, and I don't have the data. It wasn't Tarragona. available, whether it was eastbound or westbound, but. Tarragona. Um, I believe it's. The railroad Street. I believe it's approximate to that. But the, the traffic count for that was uh, 2,100 trips. That's about 1,000 and change going one way and about 1,000 and change going the other way. So you're looking at 449s, 440s versus a, you know, almost 1,100 and almost 1,000, but that's a predicted. I don't have the actual data. All I have is the total ADT, not directional. We also chose to find out some information on Romana Street between um, Savalos and 9th Street, and we found out that that trip was about 17 1745 trips and uh, there was you know about half going one way eight something going one way and 800 something going the other way so it was exactly it was darn near double the traffic that you were counting that we were actually getting on east government to the east of uh, Alconese so what we're looking at was I wanted to study that for that reason remember I told you the the, the paired uh, adjacent facility the parallel facility so on the parallel facility I was uh, we studied and found out that there was just under 2,000 trips um, both directions if you go further down Government Street, you find out there's a little over 2,000 trips, and if you actually measure within this district, it's only it's a you know it's a few under a thousand, so it's right at half the, the the amount of traffic that you'll find on East Government Street. So that data has been collected. We have made it a part of this study, and it is reflected on this this graphic here in the top left. So and we have matter. those numbers. You, we do in have this those report. numbers. The, uh, the city was kind enough to put together quickly. And under quick turnaround, some data for us to use and present to the city. But to the, I'm sorry to the, uh, the the groups that were available. So it was uh, it was handy to have that. And and let me take an opportunity to, to, to pat your folks on the back you have working for you. Um, the f people you have here working for the city of Pensacola are fantastic, able to be called upon, and will work with you at any any chance they have. So I want to applaud their effort and their help too. And it was with their help that we were able to get that information so quickly before you know a, a week and a half. Mm -hmm. So there's your, that's the traffic data um, that could accompany, again, survey data. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, I've been Pratt. trying to keep up with the order of the people today. I asked to go uh, uh, Dr. Pratt, Mr. Spencer, then Ms. Myers. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just, I would like a little more clarification, and I might have missed this in the discussion, but what question are we trying to ask, answer with this survey? Um, you know, I mean, we had a lot of community involvement. Are you trying to refine between the three proposals, or is this just another way of getting more information? I was just trying to equip you as a, as a lawmaker, essentially, with as much information as possible. Um, I feel that we, we know who cares about this street a lot. We know who they are, and they're behind me here, all right? These folks, like I said, again, spent 10 hours with me, um, and that is because they stayed after. In fact, they had one meeting they didn't have to go to. They all volunteered, every one of them volunteered to come and meet next week. It was the 19th. I think it was the 19th was an optional placeholder meeting. Every one of the groups opted to come in and meet and con converse about this and work towards um, some information for you folks. So um, I think you know who is absolutely, you, you know, you're going to find people that don't like something, like something, and the people who just don't have a whole lot of opinion on it. And I think when you get a cross-section of, of this whole district, and even if the district exceeds the CRA district boundaries and, and sort of might go along with a little bit more of my recommendation of the boundaries, um, I think um, you'll find a little bit more um, variety in your answer, which may equip you to do one thing more or you to do another thing more. And that's, that's again, not up to me. My job was to inform you guys and to give you guys as much information to make a decision as possible. That's where I was going with that. And, and I thank you for all of your time on this. And, and I think we have a lot of information. And I guess my feeling is the question's been asked and answered. Um, you know, if, if there were a compelling reason to open um, government to Ninth or to, to Bayfront, I, I could be convinced. But no one has made a solid case to me and I don't think to the rest of, of the public. I, I've, I've spoken to many of them and I've heard a lot of people say, well, if it was part of the roundabout, if it was this or that, maybe I could be convinced. So I, I know that many of the, these citizens who have been adamant in coming 
they're open to ideas, but the case hasn't been made. And I, I don't think we need a survey mm -hmm. to try to get those who were sort of on the fence to, to make their opinion known. Um, you know, I, when, when I got elected, I always told people, you know, I'll always listen to your side of the story. I might not agree with you because I might have different facts or different assumptions, but I, I always want to, you to know that I've listened and, 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 um, and respect your opinion. And I know you're not ever, always going to make everyone happy, but in this case, it feels um, like we're going to make almost everyone mad. There are few who, who would support it, but I don't think it's a hit or a make or break thing for the few who would support it. So I, I don't see a, a value in doing an additional survey at this point. Thank you. You, you said something about compelling reason. I'd, I'd say go back to the Gindro study. That was one of the one of the central things. Well, and I, I guess, and we can debate this real fast. I think that the Gindro study, the primary thing they wanted to do was calm Bayfront, and and the proposals I've, you know, great. You know, it'd be great if we could afford all of these raised crosswalks, openings, and things like that. But, but the. The amount of money that we have available that was proposed previously wasn't going to impact Bayfront. And I think the, the restoring the grid was an effort in some ways to calm the traffic on Bayfront. And I, I just haven't been convinced that, that, that the little bit of money that we have available would make that big of a difference there. And I think that there are other neighborhoods in this this city. Um, Ms. McKnight was here earlier, and my relationship with her stemmed from her interest in calming traffic on Langley, and there are small changes that could be made there with this amount of money that could make a difference. So I I appreciate the Gindro study. I think that the ideas in there were, were compelling, but I don't know that at this point we are going to be able to invest enough in this project to make those differences that, that I think the Gindra study was trying to, to address. Mr. Spencer. Thank you, President Hall. I'm, I'm putting on this headgear <laughs> based on a previous meeting in which uh, an audience member screamed at me to uh, sit down. I don't know what might happen next. Well, I'm but, away from <laughs> Seriously, thank you um, for letting me for a moment interject some humor, but I do consider this very seriously, so that was not meant as any form of disrespect for those of you that are in the audience. Um, I stumbled on uh, a sentence in, in a book I'm reading for the love of cities, for those of you that recently participated in our um, conference for neighborhoods. Um, we were treated to just some great presentations by the author, Peter, uh, I hope it's Kejayama, um, and, and Peter, the author of the book For the Love of Cities, one of his quotes really struck me, uh, particularly in the context of this issue, and that is he tried to remind all of us that government is not responsible for legislating happiness. Um, but smart communities make it a little more likely to happen by their policy decisions. Um, I would consider this particular issue a lesson in the, the art of city making and or the art of city restoration, city repairing, cities that change. Most particularly in this, it's been a, a, um, an intense lesson for me about the love affair between people and their streets. Um, and I think that actually Councilwoman DeWeese, um, I have to vacillate between my use of the word streets as um, Mr. President, as one councilwoman referenced. Um, she w was asking the question, what is the, what is the, what are the boundaries? What's the neighborhood? Where, how do we objectively define that? Um, most definitely in our four workshop meetings, what I have faced um, and have been involved and engaged in spirited dialogue, no doubt, is with citizens or those particularly people that were, um, again, demonstrating their love affair with their street, with East Government Street and with, the, and with the civil district, with the neighborhood. And whenever you are engaged in conversations with people and it involves their love affair, 
you know it's going to be intense. So we've had intense spirited discussions. Months ago, if not a year ago, some of these same individuals were giving me a hug um, and because there's a doggy fountain at Admiral Mason Park, because there's wetlands and there's birds and there's butterflies and there's sitting areas and those same people, it was like, what happened? Did you wake up on the wrong side of the bed or did I wake up on the wrong side of the bed? But that's part of what we're doing and, and I certainly hope that the people that don't see eye to eye with me um, still recall we're neighbors. We're, we're people that share a love for this city and I will do my best to represent you and respect your opinions. Um, and there's, there's little, again, little doubt that this particular issue, um, this conflict has created some, some powerful and powerful, some passionate champions that have um, been unified. They're here tonight. So I am in support of the survey only because I think it furthers our endorsement of the democratic process. And that is the reason I support the survey. It doesn't mean that we still don't have the opportunities to use opportunity and responsibility to use our analytical skills continue a discussion when that democratic process is is complete but you know I just want to share with everyone this this particular issue is exactly why local politics um, insists that we aren't bound by trying to win a popularity contest or influenced by how people may think about us um, when, when they see us walking down the street individually or personally. And I'm in favor of this democratic process that I think the survey um, will provide. Um, clearly, what, what I have witnessed is, again, a neighborhood or a streetscape, uh, most particularly, that is very much passionate about their street. But I, wanted, I want to shed some light on this. Are we, in fact, seeing a level of passion that w from a neighborhood that is in, enjoys a level of stratification? And that's the irony of this is, is uh, are we endorsing the furthering protection and separation and stratification that can, in fact, be a level of, of exclu exclusivity that is undemocratic? But at the same time, there's a fine line because it's, it's that level of exclusivity that is very much the allure of the end of East Government Street. It's, a, it's, a, it's an allure of a quiet, less traveled neighborhood and therefore we have to, we have to balance how important or what is the value of that low vehicular impact because I understand that form of separation again is exactly the allure and the romance of the end of East Government Street and their fear is justified in that they see a complete destruction of the neighborhood that they they have day to day and so again I understand their fear it's justified However, I do believe because I've traveled and traveled in many other cities where special neighborhoods, districts, and streets have connectivity and it is not the death knell, but if it is done correctly. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Myers, I know I said you were next, but Dr. Wu has not spoken yet. Thank you, Mr. President. I said to someone today that this is absolutely the worst position in the world to put government. Um, what's ideal for government is to have people come together, decide what they want, and have that government provided for them. What we have here is a case of two polar opposite sides saying, government, you decide. Um, 
I had a meeting today with some dear friends, and they made a statement that helped me an awful lot. One of the gentlemen that I met with today said, take all the emotions out of it. And I thought, well, my goodness, um, that helped because his brother is in Rotary with me. The gentleman that told me is in the Navy League with me. And I liked the family an awful, awful lot. And so they almost released me when they said, take the emotion out of it. Um, I think it boils down to, is government here to help people or is government here to act as a parent to tell you, we know better, we know what you should do, we're going to tell you when to take your medication and how? Because you're not smart enough to decide that on your own. And I take the view the government is here to help the folks because the folks are the government. Y'all are not a separate body from who we are. You are the folks who elect us. Now, having said it was awfully difficult, where I come down is I don't think the road ever should have been closed. But the same token, I told the folks I talked to today, I'm aghast that nobody within a year to two years to three years didn't get the people in power <coughs> and go to the people who, were, who closed the road and said, we don't want this closed. <coughs> the dilemma we face is that road's been closed for 30 years. I've had people tell me they bought a place there only because the road was closed. So you come down to who has the most rights. Business have the most right, or the people have the most right. And that's a hard one to call, awfully hard. I, com I commended the people of Seville Square because they came and did a business when no one was there. I mean, if you look at the land around them and what was there, uh, I admire them for coming and doing what they've done. But in my heart's a heart, I don't know if opening it would improve their business. And if they could show me where it had hurt their business, then I would vote to open it. And then the last point that I'd like to, to mention is I have never seen a group of people come to meeting after meeting after meeting. I mean, what you have displayed to me is your intense, intense love of where you live. Really, I mean, there are groups that come here and they'll sit here for one meeting and we'll never see them again. But every single time we have discussed this issue, you all have been here. And I guarantee you, if it was 10 o'clock tonight that we would be discussing this issue, that every one of y'all would still be here. So to me, that has to count for something because what you're telling me is this is so important to you that you're, rather, you're willing to put aside everything else to come down here and tell us how important it is to you. So at this stage, and of course I may be persuaded later, I'm going to get three friends that may not be friends by the time the day's over. And I hope that's not the case. But I really, in this case, don't see government being used against the people. Because as I said at the beginning, government is the people. <coughs> now, in closing, and I'll make this my last remark, there's businesses that come, I think, that have said they'd like it open. I happened to talk to Chip what, Klingen. Chip's Kurtzico. Yes. And he happens to be both a business owner, Dharma Blue, and a resident. And he said to me, I have a business. And if I thought it would improve my business, you know, I would say yes. Or if I thought it would hurt my business, 
He says, but I also am a, a resident. And I bought there because it was closed. And after 30 years, not to say that history doesn't have anything to do with it, but coupled with the passion that I see out in front of it, uh, I cannot in good conscience vote to open it at this stage. Thank you, Mr. President. Ms. Myers. Um, yes, I just want to remind council that we've only heard, uh, as in the words of Paul Harvey, only half the story. Now we need to hear the rest of the story. Y'all old enough to remember Paul Harvey? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Do any of y'all remember the Spice Girls? <laughs> Y'all don't remember that song, You Know What I Want, What I Really, Really Want? <laughs> well, I think that's what Mr. Gray's singing <laughs> there in his head. It reminds me of the Spice Girls. I know what you want, what you really, really want. Um, you want a survey? <laughs> I'll sing along with you. you want to, let's go. Well, I just get the impression that Mr. Um, Gray has somewhat of an agenda, but I would like to hear what we promised the, the citizens that they could give a report. I want to hear their report and their agenda, and then I think it's proper that we have a discussion uh, about uh, this, what we, the, the three options, whether or not uh, uh, we want to see a survey, which um, we haven't heard from the community uh, as to how they feel about a survey. Uh, so. But before we leave Mr. Gray's presentation, I just, uh, and, and hear the other uh, half of the presentation uh, from the community, um, I, I want to just take issue with Mr. Gray on one thing, and that's the comments you made regarding Councilwoman Diane Mack. I thought those comments were inappropriate, and I would hope that you would apologize to her uh, I do not feel that, I was at that meeting by the way, I was at two of the meetings, I do not feel that uh, Councilwoman Mac, uh, Mac derailed anything or changed anybody's minds. Uh, I have received a lot of emails uh, from people regarding this issue and phone calls and so I have a pretty good idea of how people over there feel and I don't think it took an outsider uh, such as uh, former city councilwoman Diane Mack to change anybody's mind. So I, I would like, I just didn't feel that that was appropriate to, to make the, the remarks she made about her in the report. So r now I'm ready if the rest of the council is, I think it's appropriate that we hear the uh, I, I do want to uh, report from the from the I, residents. I do, I do want to hear um, hear hear the report, but I've just I, I just want to before we go to the, the the public on on this, we're approaching the hour of, of seven. We've got a long agenda left ahead of us. Could we make this just a special meeting? You know where we deal with this alone. Let's finish it. We're already in this. Yeah, well, well, they're, they're going to give their report, and then I think if you, uh, if it uh, pleases the council and the president, maybe two or three people could be selected to, to, to speak. But I think the report will speak for the majority uh, 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 of the people who are against closing Government Street, I would assume. So I think we could deal with it that way, is that their report is going to, we can show, have a maybe show of hands for people who, support the results of, of the report, and that way we wouldn't have to hear from a lot of people. Okay. Would, yes, Larry. Yeah, I'm going to make mine real quick, and I know it's getting very late, and I appreciate that, but I just want to kind of touch on what Dr. Wu said for one minute. And that is, it's, it's real tough sitting up here trying to make this decision. I've got friends that feel passionate about, they're on both sides of the fence on this issue. Uh, uh, Dr. Wu mentioned one of my very close friends uh, doesn't want to see this reopened. I've got other friends that are business owners uh, that feel the opposite. So this isn't an easy decision for us. And, and uh, I know whichever way we go on this, that there's going to be repercussions and people that are going to be upset with us. And it's just not an easy decision. And I just hope that everyone out there 
realizes that that uh, you know we're we're elected and uh, we try to try to see the big picture and 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 what's for the greater good and and uh, this isn't personal with me I'm trying to remove myself from the emotion of it but I just want everyone in the room to understand that that that, that, that you know it's 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 tough when when you have when you have a an issue like this before you and you have friends that you that, that are on both sides of the fence and uh, I just uh, hope that everyone t t treats everyone with respect I know there were some pretty heated meetings I had heard that and uh, and um, I, I just want everyone to know that not only myself but I'm sure that everyone's sitting around this table that this is a really tough um, decision that we have friends on both sides of this issue thank you mr. president yes, thank you very much my name is Virginia Wilson and you've seen me before. Um, lower, this, start, lower the this started uh, yeah, back you. in March, and I brought 61 names. And I only had a short while to do that because we weren't aware of what was going on with the um, idea of opening Government Street. Um, I have here in my hand 141 names. I can go out and get more. And I asked Mr. Gray, how many signatures do I have to have? And I can go get more. I was in sales for years. I can go out and I can knock on every door. I wasn't aware of this new grid of where we're supposed to get names. And I can go back out and do that. But I have 141 names. And these people, they're not just residents of Government Street. They're not just residents of Intendencia and Alcanese and Church and Adams, they're all over the historic district, all the way to Palafox. And they're not just residents. They're attorneys, they're doctors, they're realtors, they're chiropractors, they're shopkeepers. You name it, I have it here. And I promise you, if you look through this book, you will be very, very surprised. I didn't twist these people's hands. I went to each and every one of them, including some of my other neighbors. We went out and we talked to them and we got their opinion. And they signed our petition. They do not want to see Government Street open. Now, the reason we don't want Government Street open is because there's no reason to open it. We have nine ways of getting in to the area where we are. If someone wants to go, and I understand, and I love Seville Quarter. When I first moved here, I was there all the time. I was a young girl then. I was younger than, than I am now. And I was there all the time. I loved it. So there are many ways to get to Seville Quarter. And believe me, the people find their way there. If you want to go somewhere, you're going to find your way there. If you want to go down 9th Avenue and go to Seville Square, uh, Quarter, why would you take a right on Government Street? Well, all you have to do is go to just a few more feet and go on Bayfront Parkway. And then you go down and you take a right and you're on um, Tarragona, boom, you're there. All the parking's there and everything. Why would you want to go down Government Street? And if we take Government Street, as Mr. Gray is suggesting, and that we put the stop signs, and we put the tables, and we shrink the, the street in, if, that's a big if, then they wouldn't want to go down there, would they? They still wouldn't want to go down there. Why would they go down there? They're, it's easy to get to those places. The attorneys, the doctors, they're not there because someone is driving by and there they are. Oh, I'm gonna stop there, there's an attorney. No, people are going there because they know that there's an attorney there they want to see for a specific reason. So that's why. So these people know that. If you wanna table this again, you want, to, you want to say, okay, let's all go come back another time. You're trying to wear us down. You're not going to wear us down. You do a survey. This survey 
I don't know if you know about surveys, but the percentage of returns on surveys is very low, very low. And the majority of the people that are going to fill this out is us because we don't want the street open. Now, we've given you a really nice al alternative. And I think it would beautify our area. And not only just there, but I'm suggesting that we do a nice entry on the, at Alkanese on both ends. And we, we let people know where is the historic district. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about Government Street, where I live. We're talking about the historic district. And Government Street is the heart of it. Not because it's Government Street. It's because it's right smack in the middle of it. Let's take a knife and let's stab the hist historic district right there in the heart. And let's watch it just fall apart again. Because years ago, when I moved here from Lakeland, Florida, Lakeland is a beautiful town. It is pristine. There's flowers everywhere. Christmas, everything's decorated. It's beautiful. I moved here, and I said, yuck, what am I doing here? This is awful. Because it was. It was and it's so much better than it was. Your bay was terrible. I was used to clean, fresh water. It was so bad, porpoise wouldn't go in there. Smarter than that. And you finally clean that up. But let's not destroy something that you've worked hard to build. And that's what it's going to do. And I'm not a genius. And I'm not a planner. But I think I can see that. And all these people that have signed this, they see that. I have nothing against any of you. What I'm against is the idea of what, you're, of what has been presented. And that's all I have to say. OK, thank you. I'd like to present this to you, please. Sure. Would you give it to the clerk, please? Thank you. OK, uh, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, um, Yes. Uh, Mr. President, yeah. I'm not sure that she was giving the report. Uh, there, oh, I I'm think sorry. There are two other people that want to give a report. There yeah. were, there and, were three. And Ms. Regan's going to get her, her office. Well, there were, there were three people who were yeah. giving sections, different sections of the report. Right. And this Li is just the first one. Liability, walkability, and the other is uh, right. um, traffic. Yes, I'm sorry. There are okay. two people. I'm, I'm going to try to keep this balanced. If the gentleman from... Uh, um, um, Seville would like to uh, speak for a moment. No, we'll, we'll let the report get all the way well, up. Well, it'll be just chopped up. Is what well, I'm it will be, but you know what, okay. Ms. Myers, I don't know who the three are, okay? No. Okay. So. Right. You don't, you don't know who she's corralled. Um, um, Mr. President and members of the council, uh, I've been here for as long as you have. No, not you, but most everybody. And I'm quite tired, but I'm not too tired to stay here as long as it takes for the story of the other side of the, I thought Paul Harvey was the rest of the story, but it appears that the rest of the story on my side of this issue uh, will take me to tell it, and I would be hogging a bunch of time uh, to, to come anywhere near the time that has been utilized so far, and apparently more to come, but I, I'm ready to do that if you're ready to listen. But I don't, I don't think it's very fair. I had in mind that this meeting would adjourn probably after the rendition of the report, maybe a brief discussion, and be the, the, the subject of a special town, uh, committee of the whole meeting in the future when we could get Every so we can organize our presentations, 30 minutes to the side, an hour to the, and a half total maybe, and get this out. When I hear statements made, such as Dr. Dr. Pratt's, and she doesn't see that people are hurt or that they're that serious, I'm prepared to show her the, the seriousness of it when I hear uh, 
other things like nobody is in, an, uh, there's no real push to get this done. I, I'm prepared to go into an extensive history of it, a lot of very, very strong showings that have gone on before about it needing to be done, needed to be done a lot. It's right here in Mr. Gendros's report, which, you know, it's going to take a while. That, the report is uh, funded by UWF. I haven't heard from UWF. They own 17 or 27, I've forgotten which it is, parcels of property in this district. And my understanding is that they, uh, they have to have more time to, for their board to uh, re be registered in on how they would regard that. That's a whole lot of property down there that they own, and it's their report that is the basis of the Gendros report, which is the basis of our opposition. And I can explain in, in full detail, and I'm willing to do it if I fall dead in the spot, but we've exhausted everybody that's here, I'm sure, as well as myself, but I'm, I'm prepared to do that if you will give me the time, and I won't take up as much as has already been taken up, but I'll have to have some assistance. I'm not a uh, bullet person. Uh, I, I can never read what's on. I've been in this room. I could never read what was put up there. It's not very clear. And I can, those are nice drawings, but I don't have anything that could flash up a bigger one on the screen. But I have the documents here to back up everything I say, and I'm willing to do it the old fashioned way if needs be. But it lo looks like it needs be. So if you will give me the time, I will. I will give you the best defense I can of what I think of the facts that, uh, that motivated this in the first place and where it stands today. Now, if you'd rather adjourn and we'll let both sides finish at a later time, uh, I'll be glad to do that, but I'm prepared to go on until I drop uh, if uh, need appar be. Apparently the committee wants to, to come to some resolution tonight and well, I, would, I, don't, I would have liked to have done it, you know, in, in a meeting of its own, but... Uh, yeah, well, a lot of time has been devoted to it, obviously, and I can't, can't take that away, but I kept saying, well, maybe, maybe somebody will say, let's do a, the uh, survey. I'm not really impressed by the need for a survey. There's been, uh, there's been hearings. But I do think if you get with the, the history that you've already shared with me, well, and, I and found it very, know, very interesting. Uh, a lot of you do know already. But uh, I can, I'm, I'm going to do it if you'll let me do it. Sure. Because I think it's important. Uh, Buck, bring me that uh, thing up here. If you, I want to see those. Yeah. This is my son, Buck. Sit down. My other son had to, sit down. Jack had to go back to work. Sir, sir, would you like <laughs> to sit down? Where Alan, where Alan's sitting. Or yeah. Or this other one. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's better. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. And, and you'll need to pull it right up to your mouth there. Don't have to? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you fine. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Um, I want to establish my name is Wilmer Mitchell, and I'm a native born Pensacolian lived in the city limits in the East Hill in uh, uh, half my life and subsequently moved to uh, the Warrington area where I've lived. I've worked on Government Street every day of my career as a lawyer, 52 years. Uh, I own Seville Quarter with my wife and my six children and we've owned that since 1988 and I was uh, practicing law on Government Street. At the time, we started the historic district restoration movement. And I say we because we did it, but I wasn't one of the ones that started it. There were some thrilling people involved. Mary Turner Rule is the one who sticks in my mind the most, a Pensacola native who came back home and energized the whole community, young people, old people, everywhere. Uh, she fought over Lee Square, she fought over the fountain being removed from the Plaza Ferdinand, and she lost both of those battles, but in essence, she won them. They put the fountain back years later. They stored it and brought it back. And she shamed all of us because Pensacola's history wasn't being appreciated. 
There was no historic restoration movement, preservation movement, no nothing. And but her fight uh, with o over those issues, which she apparently lost, she turned into a, a real surging victory by her efforts in the historic district. It wasn't any district there, but that's what became the historic district. And everybody, let's see, I'm 79 years old, so however many years it was in 1967, but I was a young practicing lawyer with no money, and she energized all of us, and including a client of mine named Bob Snow. He was a young client, a uh, naval uh, person who had settled here, and he opened. I mean, th th that's interesting, Mr. Mitchell, but we do need to get to the. the all right, the, I, the but I think the full background needs to be known. I'm going to give it, and I don't think I'll take as much time as already been taken on the other side. I don't begrudge him that. There are more of them here. But at any rate, in uh, 1967, we started some things in the district, and and they, they resulted in a, an immense improvement. The door house is the first building that anybody made a mortgage on, anybody bought and restored. That was a, the Heritage Foundation, and we founded the Heritage Foundation. I was one of the founding members. They bought the little door house and they started everything. We had the first evening in Seville. First evening. Thought we'd get 2,500 people. Got 10,000. Everybody was hungry for it all over the city. And this is, goes beyond just downtown. It goes beyond the city limits. It's, so people from Crestview came over to eat the gazpacho salad that I sold right in front of the door house, and they got the money. They actually came early. We sold out in an hour. And we went on, and that was an exciting thing, and the, the, the uh, Junior League of Pensacola and the Pensacola Historic Preservation Board, no, that's not right, the uh, Heritage Foundation Preservation Board wasn't in existence. They sponsored the evening in Old Seville. They raised a lot of money, got a lot of interest. We went down individually and as a group and as the Heritage Foundation with the help of the city. They were jumping all over it. An improved Seville quarter, uh, not quarter, square, right. built the gazebo, all the houses around there. I did three houses on the north side of Seville Square. Uh, that are there now, are rented. I rented them, rebuilt them. Bought, everything was cheap because were, everything was vacant where Seville Quarter is. Well, all yes. vacant buildings. And, and, but Mr. Mitchell, we really need to, to focus on, on the issue of, of Government Street. All right, after all that was done, and the historic restoration program was going gangbusters, and basically property values had quintupled or more. Then Mr. Snow had left town. Most of his effort was in Orlando. And, but there was a move to build the Bayfront Parkway. And in the plan for the Bayfront Parkway, the Historic Pensacola Preservation Board, which by that time had been created as a state agency and got us millions, hundreds of thousands, certainly dollars in state money for the histor historic district. They had a, had a part to do with how that road was to be constructed, okay? Well, it turns out that their Mr. Jim Moody was their executive director, and he had implanted in there an idea, which was his idea in the early 70s, which nobody, I, I didn't know much about it, but it was to insulate, isolate the historic district, make it an island, cut it off from the water from the other community, basically. And one way to do that is going to close Alconey Street. It's going to close all those streets on that side, including Government Street. And well, when we found that out, and Mr. Snow was, abs and he still is to this day, he was absolutely puzzled. What can they be talking about? Why are you going to close Government Street? He said, "It's it's the uh, the lifeblood of the of the area. It's it's a boulevard. It's a through street." So. I said, well, I, I'm, I don't like it at all. I'll try to stop it. So I did. And I went and got a, sig a petition signed for not to, not to close East Government Street, 
but to leave it open to connect with Ninth Avenue, which was being widened and extended, and the Bayfront Parkway, which was being built. And no, no through traffic for trucks, but other than that, not to close that street. And that was what was in the initial plan that had been approved by the uh, historic Pensacola Preservation Board. And everybody wanted to go along with whatever they want, including the city. So the city had adopted that as well. And I said, that we, we thought that was a terrible idea. I got over 80 signatures. They were focused on government street from Palafox to uh, Ninth Avenue. And that was the focus of the thrust of the petition. And I have the proof of it, exactly how it went. I would have a PowerPoint deal if I were that smart or my son had been able to pull it off. But uh, I never could read that screen. And it's up there very well anyway. But at this meeting in, in, in uh, 1980, April 8th, it was brought up to them. And they said, Mr. Wilmer Mitchell presented a position that said, don't close Government Street while you're building this road. Leave it open to two-way traffic and, uh, uh, f and connecting and with Ninth Avenue and with Bayfront Parkway. They had a long discussion because their executive director had led them to believe the insular concept was very good. And it says in here, after extensive discussion, and they don't even mention that they had an executive session where they went from the Tivoli High House down there where we had the meeting, they went and they had a discussion about would they back their director up or would they do what these, this uh, petition showed. And by the way, the petition that I got, when I rolled it out, it was everything on Government Street was in green. Blue, actually, it was in. Blue. And it was almost no interruption. From one. And also, we had enough time that we got people both sides. Now, I didn't have people out of the, the area, and I know where the historic district is. But we focused on those because those were the people, and there were businesses, and there were uh, residents, but there was nobody in opposition to not closing. Don't close the street. And the historic Pensacola Preservation Board came back and said, well, looks like that was a bad idea. And we have voted. They took a vote 10 zip our way. They said, now you take that, take that to the city because they have a say in this too. I said, I'm on my way. And I have the minutes of the city council meeting which this is dated at the top, the 24th of April, but down here they're acting on a committee memorandum of April 18th, 1980. And they adopted on this page what the Pensacola Historic Preservation Board has said, uh, nine to one. So that was the first time that the peep city representing the people had spoken, and both of those were sent to the DOT, and they agreed, and it hadn't had to go to Washington to get the final approval. Got hung up in Washington. I can, we couldn't figure out why, but we knew that it shouldn't be in the package. But, as I've said before, and it's, I don't want to over-dramatize it, but it's the truth, the contractor who was going, building South 9th Avenue Extension said, Mike, he didn't tell us till he, after he did it. He went out on a Sunday with a bulldozer, and he bulldozed the dirt up and closed the street. Now, if you wonder, Mr. Wu, why we didn't do something about it, then we have every person that I know of that's in the, in the business has been unhappy with that ever since it was closed. It, by the way, it was a nightmare down there. It was a curb when they built a curb. And it took people driving down there and going over the curb. It looks like a, a boulevard. And they could see out in front of them the bridge, and here's this nice traffic, and they didn't realize, and boom. Well, they kept putting up more and more signs, but that still didn't stop the school buses on the, who came down to the, uh, see the museum, museums and stuff. There'd be three of them down there. There wasn't an adequate turnaround lane. OK, that, that got better. Was finally, people did get used to it, but as recently as recently, uh, Bob Kerrigan, who is going to be on our side of this, uh, he owns five properties down there, including at the far end, who's not hurt. And he's right there at the street, and he's got his people have to go out this way to get away from. Well, 
the, uh, the, the street, we tried to get it open, and none of that made a whole lot of progress because it's not easy. And then the, Mr. Gendros, you got his report, at the behest of UWF made a study, three or four expert engineers, Mr. Gendros was one of the experts, and he rendered for the University of West Florida this report, which you have, because it became the city's report. Sure. This is the master plan. Now, each one of those purple tabs re references something that we support in our petition for back then, which, by the way, ended up being two-way traffic, but no truck traffic. No, no through truck traffic. Trucks have to go sometimes, but not any, th and that's the way our petition read then, and that's what was approved in this. And to do this, they had the most extensive meetings and studies. They interviewed widely. This is written up in their process. Widely, all interest in the district of every kind. And we have, you know, Christ Church. We have museums. We have businesses. We had residents. Interviewed all of those types of interest. And then uh, they put in here, they had three heavily attended public meetings. These meetings had 69, the meetings that, that we're talking about uh, that just occurred, I have the numbers, 69, the first meeting. 49, how many, what are there? 69 people out of the 400 that were set plus that were invited, 69, then they had another meeting uh, that has been mentioned, there were 48, and then another meeting, the next meeting was 40, and then the last meeting was 48. That's 48 people out of the 400 in the district and out of the 55,000 or 58,000 in the city. And that those people were very determined that they objected to the city, uh, that the street being reopened. But in the Gendros survey, which by the way, those meetings were over 200 per meeting, 15 focus groups, and they were long in-depth discussions and this is a result of that. And one of the things they did was uh, give the dots to the attendants and go put them on the map and show us what you like least and what you like best. And then that's why these purple things, you'll see that the thing that they liked the least was the end of Government Street being what every one of those experts said was the biggest mistake and the most stirring thing that needed to be done stuck out like a sore thumb just had to be remedied and was unhealthy because all the historic districts that Mr. Kendross and those respected people, and he was, he, boy, he was sharp and everybody liked him and thought he was really teaching the stuff. And he was studying for just the district and came up with the master plan. But he said, you got to do that. But it, go up there and you put what is your most disliked thing about the way the situation is now. And this is in 2004. And that end of the thing is in here, right there, and you have the report. It is covered up with red, mine being one. They only gave you one. But there were so many that they're on top of each other as being the worst part of anything that's going on. And then they implemented solutions to that, which is his, his solution is the one we like the best. It's not subject to final design. Maybe there's some niceties to it. But it was to reconnect. And his uh, reconnect all three. Government, 9th Avenue, and the Bayfront Parkway. And then the, at the final meeting, they said, go up and put out what the things that you like that need to be implemented and our solutions that we're recommending, and that was one of them that I'm looking at right there. Put your, this needs to be done first on that. And it was covered up again with those dots, each person having only one vote. So here was something that they all recognized as being terrible and that the people that supported it from one end of uh, the opening of this, keeping it open from one end of the other eight, uh, years before would have said the same thing. And so that was agreed to be done in this plan, which was readopted in the CRA's plan, which the city, that was in 2004. This is 2010. Okay, so in the past, there have been efforts. Now, plans get shelved. Uh, shelved. I do. Our strong mayor 
mayor, who I have not spoken to about this, but I know his, his intent because he's not hiding it. He wants to implement some of those plans. And he's trying to take the steps to do that. And we support him in that. And I'm telling you, uh, I have my petition that I'm going out there after 32 years ago, I did it before, and I can get a very impressive petition. I already have all, all the way up to uh, Hub Stacy's, uh, with almost no exception. I'm filled in every blank because it's been raining. I'm an old man. I can't get out there and do all that. My boys are working, mm. barely able to get them. But I, this, this is the petition. I'm not ready to submit it. I, I only started it oh, eight days ago, and that included two days that were weekend and nobody was there. But the petition beginning, and you fold that up. This is not exactly modern high tech. Hold it up. That should point out where Palazzo Ferdinand is, Buck. Okay. From here, the Plaza Ferdinand Palafox, already, that's Seville Quarter, by the way. Right the there. Village. Huh? Not a Seville issue. Well, it's the whole street, and I'm feeling I'm going as I did before. I'm starting here, and I'm going that way. I do have this one building which is on, not in the district. The rest of this is the district. Everything else is within the district. Owners or tenants. This, by the way, though, is owned by Jim Wilson and some people, and they sign because they feel they're affected and because they're getting ready to sign this one right here with Bill Wilshire, and that'll be that. This is a vacant parking lot. And I'm going to go right on down. It won't be everybody. We have one uh, lawyer, and these are a lot of law offices and stuff. One lawyer who says, I won't sign it until you tell me exactly what you're going to build there. And we said, we're supporting that, but well, it's not our say exactly how it is to be done. Well, until I won't sign, but that's the only one that hadn't signed. And I do know some others that are not. There are some people in this group that, that are opposing it that actually live there. I'm going to be able to prove, if time is permitted, uh, that there's, uh, there's a whole lot of opposition to it. I would like to know how the University of West Florida is reacting to what would be a, 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 a refusing their plan that they engendered. I think it's, it deserves more hearing than it would have if you had a vote tonight. And I notice we have two council members, who are, one of who's sick, and I don't know where Mr. Charles is. But I would like to have them involved before this is finally decided. Also, in Sunday's paper, Mr. Wilson wrote a nice uh, letter, a, a viewpoint, expressing quite well their position, which I went to three out of four of those meetings. And uh, I was a little bit uncomfortable because I got a hand at the first one. I presented some of this. Uh, when I skipped the second one, I had something else I had to do. When I met, went to the third one, I found out that the meeting now belonged to the people who are in opposition. However many there were, 40, what was it, 50 something. There were 49 of them there. And there were, I don't, I'm gonna guess there were about nine people uh, for op opening the road and the others were not. I'm gonna guess. Actually, no vote was ever taken about who's a po who wants to open it. It was only show of hands in the final analysis. Show of hands, and they, uh, they were in the majority at those meetings. But when I went to the uh, third meeting and I got up and spoke, I began, I, I have never been heckled until then in my life. I'm a lawyer, I can take it, maybe deserve it sometime. But I had never actually experienced it. And uh, people, I did have some strange remarks made to me, uh, which I don't take too personally, but I didn't appreciate some of them. I, it's not, they were not hostile people. These are actually nice people. But they felt like the, the books were cooked against them to start with. And I said, well, the truth is, maybe that they, maybe they were because all of this preceding stuff indicated it should be done. Every, what's the question? But I thought certainly they should have their fair hearing, and they certainly should, and they will. But I don't think if you vote now that you're going to get a fair hearing. I am going to write a response to the viewpoint that was written, and I'm going to try to do it in the same way. I'm going to try to get input from the Heritage Foundation, I haven't heard from them, the Pensacola Historical Society, we haven't heard from them, the University of West Florida, we haven't heard from them, except their, their report, 
which I want to hear their comments on that, and also the, the wonderful plans they have to help the historic district and to vote money. So I don't think this ought to be voted on with the, the two people gone and the other, uh, uh, the issue not fully developed, and I don't think it is yet, because there is a whole lot more opposition, and it is impassioned, I hope, but not vicious, and I don't think they are either. And I think they are serious and want it, want it, don't want it open. But I don't think they have a case that stands up as to why, because this, this thing here that is in the city's 2010 report is, oh, does I'm a lot very, of good I'm things. Very, very, very aware of that. Yeah. And, and the report before that. And the I should make that. one remark, and I'll close on this, and I don't want to, uh, I, I think this, this, this should be put off for further staff study and for further input of information, and then for a full and fair hearing, everybody can be fully prepared and not tired and all that, and we can give both sides hearing and vote it up or down. It's hard for me then. It won't, it isn't now because I think it's not, uh, not the way to do it. But I was, uh, did attend the meetings, and at the one I attended, they said, you want to sit, go to any table you want. There were only there were three tables, three pedestrian and so forth and uh, vehicular and then design where they put it together. Well, I saw this, which was up earlier in the it's evening. On. It's not on the board now. Right, it's uh, the middle right one. Well, uh, okay, you know, the middle right one, I see it up there. This design here, which I thought, well, the gateway, the gateway plaza title is kind of right because that's exactly where the gateway from that side should be. And it should be handsomely done and can be on that mode, but isn't it funny they call it the Gateway Plaza when what it is is a, and I know there's no money for this, there's no money for anything. We're not arguing the money. Don't do anything until you got the money, but that's the, that's the Gateway Roadblock. That's okay. it, that's all it is, and I don't think it should be adopted in any way. Mr. Mitchell, I'm, I'm going to ask you to wrap it up. I, that's it. it. You know, it's, he did. He's yeah. getting late, as they say. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, May I say something? Yes, ma'am. Just come to the mic and identify yourself. Hello. I'm Kathy Tanner. I'm the owner of Tanner Realty. I'm at 421 East Saragossa. I'm also at 420 Bayfront Parkway as a, as a property owner. Um, first of all, Alan Gray, thank you very much. You conducted those meetings beautifully. You were hot on, in the seat. I don't know how you handled it. If you were my son, I would just embrace you for good manners and um, a wonderful spirit. You, you went through a lot to go to listen to the passion of all our neighbors. Um, I um, am one who wants to go down Government Street. I feel Government Street is one of the highest elevated streets in historic Pensacola. I know this because I have driven the street and I've driven Tarragona four hours after Hurricane Ivan. I think for public safety, their, um, Government Street should be open. It is a high elevated street. If you um, are riding down it and you are looking towards the um, 17, you're going to see it, it has an open vista. But you get down there and there's these little pot things that stop traffic. That is so uninviting. And when I moved here from Tampa, Florida, it was the most obnoxious thing I ever saw. I couldn't understand why I was not invited into our historic district. The end of Government Street is not a private gated community. It is, it would be nice if it was, it would be nice if it's a plaza, but it can be a quiet entry into downtown Pensacola and restoring our grid. We are restoring our character again we are, we are inviting, we are embracing, and I think it is very selfish to keep that road closed from the public, and I always have. Um, Dr. Wu and the replacement for the missing Mr. President and council members. I'm Ed Mueller from Savalo Street in Pensacola. I planned to speak and requested to put an agenda item on for the reply of the citizens group 
uh, just in case we had some disagreement with the report from Mr. Gray. Uh, I didn't make the agenda due to a miscommunication. I sent it to, I sent our report to an expired email address, but we have corrected that and provided a written copy to you at today's meeting. Um, Who's in charge of the meeting? Correct. I was going to ask him if he wanted to sit down with the people who want to give that report to sit here. You know, they haven't given, had their chance. I could just sit here. No. He's getting his notes. He's just going to stop. You can't have your notes back. Good. Um, how does this work? Okay. Uh, can you speak just a little, little louder? Uh, yes. Um, the report as submitted by Mr. Gray is accurate as submitted mostly or sort of up to a point, up to page 17. Uh, I would say that there was no one speaker who persuaded everybody to suddenly be against consensus. Um, I don't remember that happening. Um, there, were, there was consensus on the walkability committee, but I'll let my fellow presenter talk about walkability. But in the auto and traffic, I was the team leader for automobile and traffic, and there was no consensus ever. There were, at various counts, uh, three members who voted in favor of keeping government or opening Government Street. Uh, in my report, I mentioned a 50 to 3 count that was taken at one of the larger meetings where a raise of hands for how many people want Government Street was held, and three hands went up, and everyone else. We see the number was either 48 or 49 was the balance of the vote. Um, I led the discussion and we had those three people on the automobile committee. We presented a possibility of having an east, an in, out, right in, right out, and that was disagreed. And that was disagreed when we had our consensus meeting. The consensus of the group I'll just give, read three and a half lines to go fairly quickly. The results of the vote on line items, the group was overwhelmingly opposed, approximately 50 to 3, connecting East Government Street to 9th, either Bayfront or 9th Avenue for vehicular access. Um, I'll come back and give some of the statistics that we've already heard, but I'll repeat the traffic statistics. A majority, vast majority, voted against any additional uh, access from East Zaragoza, Savalos, or Florida Blanca. We had considered opening Florida Blanca. And at one of the meetings, the second or third meeting, people from Florida Blanca showed up and said that they didn't think Florida Blanca should be open because there's only one lane for traffic. There's parking on both sides. And we now see that one of the modifications provided as a subsequent thing Item three in your report says uh, reduce parking on one side of Florida Blanca so that it could be open. The people on Florida Blanca did not want that open and they came to our meeting and convinced the majority and so we agreed with them. Uh, by another vast majority, the group agreed to a pedestrian bicycle gateway plaza and you, have, you may have seen this design or may have not seen this design. This is the gateway plaza which would be in this way going down to 9th and this would just be a turnaround for people who come down there and have to make a turnaround anyway. Also had the mini circle at Savalos. That's all assuming money. We did not make any of our uh, assumptions assuming money was readily available. What we did was we spoke, okay, if we get BP money, we can convert it all to this. Uh, the second half sentence, the group also favored underground utilities, new acorn style lighting, six foot sidewalks, and improved landscape, streetscape on East Government with additional green spaces. The group did not put in a bicycle lane because of the low traffic. I want to go over the traffic once again. On Government Street at Tarragona, there's 2,100 cars east and west per day, which is approximately 1,100 each direction. But when you get down to Alcanis, it's 415 heading one way and 485 the other. 
If you compare Romana Street, which does have access to 9th, you get 961 east, 853 west, approximately double. If you do 9th Street heading south, there's 2,300 cars per day heading south. We assumed that more than double of our traffic would come from opening Government Street. We assumed the traffic would dr that dramatically increase, and we didn't come up with any numbers higher than that. Um, in the final recommendation, that's not actually part of your contract because the contract says discuss the combined recommendations that the city group came up with. But as part of those recommendations, it said contact the 450 or 460 people in that design area. Before we had the meetings in July, handouts were dropped off at each address in that area. 450 handouts were handed out. Of those handouts, you saw who showed up in the meeting, 69 at one meeting, 48 at the next. We have now 141 signatures from people in that general area who now say they oppose opening Government Street. I think if you do another survey, I think you're wasting your time, and I think no further action would be necessary on your part. I'm Ann Regan, uh, 424 East Government Street. Now, this is the second part of this two-part report on the meetings of the share stakeholders, as Mr. Gray called us, these public meetings for input. At the last of the four meetings, we discussed with Mr. Gray how to report back to the council on our, our final results. Mr. Gray said that the two chairs of the task force groups, Wendy Labra Labarge and Ed, would report to the council. Uh, Wendy couldn't be here, and that's why I'm reporting. He said that he would be in touch with Ed and Wendy in order to help them prepare the one final report to the council, and that they could use the information gathered by the West Florida Regional Planning Council to help prepare that report. Mr. Gray never contacted either Wendy or Ed, so our spokesperson, Talbot Wilson, contacted Mr. Gray. Mr. Gray emailed that he had spoken with Mr. Reynolds, and after that talk, Allen emailed that he alone would prepare the, rep the final report. This turn of events meant that now you are being provided two reports, Mr. Gray's and ours. It also means that neither the chairpersons the, who, who chaired the task force groups, nor any neighbors who attended the meetings had any input into Alan Gray's report. We also did not review it for accuracy because it was provided to the council before, before we had that opportunity. And we still have not had the opportunity except if we, if we read it uh, as it was presented on the website. Also importantly, we had no input regarding Mr. Gray's remarks regarding Diane Mack. I personally found those remarks to be false, gratuitous, and unprofessional. The city administration has spent $18,000 to hire the West Florida Regional Planning Council and to have these meetings specifically to get the input of what they called the stakeholders. The stakeholders have voted overwhelmingly not to open Government Street. Those results are indicated in our report that Ed has referred to, and under the heading of results of the group vote who, that voted on online items, and it begins, the first bullet point is, the group was overwhelmingly opposed, 50 to 3, to connecting East Government Street to either 9th Avenue or Bayfront Parkway for vehicular access. And the final thing I want to mention is that that rendering that Mr. Gray mentioned that's on page 15 that he talked about for a long time was overwhelmingly rejected by our group. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gray. Well, I suppose I'm using the microphone again that way. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. 
Um, I just wanted to say that we, we did prepare a report, that the, the report was exactly the findings of everything that every meeting ended with, that the report you see before you is a factual representation of the ending of each meeting. You can see that progression. It's apparent. It's stark differences between the last meeting and the third meeting, that uh, there was nothing misrepresented about it, that I think that we did as a group uh, a fairly good job. Nothing's perfect when you, when you include people. But I think we did a fairly good job of uh, representing what these public involvement meetings were about. Um, I, I, again, uh, don't know what's involved in the, in the process over here, but I did get in touch with Mr. Uh, Muller on the phone. And uh, I actually let him speak with uh, Mr. Mr. Wilson and, in fact, put those two together because we were having some trouble on when we were going to coordinate a meeting with the Committee of the Whole. And it would appear that Mr. Reynolds would prefer that the uh, city had some chance to see a report before it actually goes before you. So we chose tonight as the night to present this before Committee of the Whole. So there was a miscommunication on my part as to when we would actually do this. I thought we were going to be doing this earlier in the month. But the, the fact was uh, we had a report to prepare. Um, that it was uh, necessary to give it some daylight before it actually was heard. Um, and we chose tonight. And that was a choice that, uh, that Bill left with me, that we could, uh, we could do fine with it tonight, and they would need it by thus and such a day. Um, again, I don't think there's a thing in this thing that's misrepresented. Uh, the fact was those things were set at the meetings. In fact, there are 30 people that are quoted in my report, you'll see, 30 people. And I think they're quoted as fair as we can get it. Um, we had the benefit of video records for the first meeting because it was broadcast and provided by the city on the website. At the meetings, we had to depend on staff. So I had staff with me, so it wasn't just me alone. It was the report of the West Florida Regional Planning Council. It was a report of my, my executive director, myself. Um, our transportation division director also was responsible for taking notes at each of these meetings. And we all compiled all those notes at the end of each meeting, brought them forth, and uh, staff assisted all those in the, in the meetings. And they came up with a summary list. That summary list is that end piece that you see. There's nothing about it that's been changed. There's nothing about it that's different. And the fact that it's being called into question is, uh, is what it is. But the fact is I'm telling you how it was prepared and what, what, what got it to the point where you get to read it. Um, no, I was not uh, consulting the, uh, the folks in the meetings when I came up to the summaries. But the, the summaries were the larger parts of the meetings, you know, you know sort of digested and then brought back to you, and it was a large part of the meeting, in my opinion. So I brought it forth, thought it bared, it bared mentioning. I thought it was a disservice, and it was not honest to not mention, unfortunately. It, uh, it hurt some feelings, and I do want to apologize to Diane Mack uh, for saying that about uh, the way that it was presented, and I apologize to you, but I felt that, uh, I felt that it was a changing moment in, uh, in the meetings that I had been uh, very much personally involved with for the last month. But again, um, it appears it's hurt some feelings, and that was so far from the, the, the point. I just was trying to make a point that there was, um, you know, a, a big, big thing happened at the beginning of that meeting, and whether it, I don't know if it swayed the, the group, but it, it was a very impassioned speech is what it was. And I think that um, it, it bared mentioning. But I do apologize that it, that it hurt the feelings that it did. I certainly don't, didn't, didn't intend it to do that. I apologize. But, but again, I felt like I, I needed to say what I just said because of the process, um, the professionalism that we represent. And, and I also want to mention, I don't know, um, you have staff here at the city that are AICP certified, and that's got a code of ethics. It took me 10 years to get there. And it's not something I just, you know, I wheeled around and, you know, and, and, you know, goof around with. It's very serious and that we are ethically bound to do certain things. And I think that this, uh, this report represents that level of professionalism. I think the report from the Planning Council represents that level of professionalism. Um, and hopefully the products the city is pleased with, again, I've labeled some shortcomings, and that would be just in the amount of data I'm giving you guys as lawmakers. Okay. That's it. That's all I had to say. Okay. We, we, uh, we don't have a motion on the floor, so this isn't um, in order to be debated uh, among council. And what I would prefer is we not make a motion um, um, tonight and that we um, come back with a specific recommendation either from the president of the council or from the, the, the mayor's office and, and have that recommendation that we can move and second um, debate and we can vote it up or vote, 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 it, vote it down. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you the reason that 
and I'm not trying to protect one side or the other, but I am trying to protect that CRA report. I don't know if you guys remember my first two years on council, I carried around a big old yellow satchel, and I had like seven or eight great big thick reports in there, and I was just waiting for the opportunity to pull them out, because somebody had voted to do another study. And I pulled all of them out one by one and says, and what did we do with this? We put it on the shelf and let it gather dust. That's where the CRA report that, that we commissioned uh, through Looney, Ricks, and Kiss um, came from um, was, was uh, generated out of, out of that. And, and I just look back at the history that Mr. Mitchell gave us, the things that were intended to have been done that for whatever reason did not get done the Gendros report, the CRA study, which had absolutely unprecedented input from the public on, on, on that, is that I just don't want to see um, that completely lost. Um, I sense where this is, is going to go in, in, in the very end, um, but again, we don't have the motion on, on, the, on the floor right now to debate it, and I just hope that we can um, allow us to, to, to bring this back up just one more time with a specific recommendation. It's just a discussion item tonight. Um, when you mentioned the CRA, it reminded me that um, um, with regard to Government Street and ownership, um, the, I looked up the, the ta at the tax assessor's office and it appears that uh, you know, either they're wrong or you didn't realize, Mr. Spencer, that you own property at uh, according to the tax assessor at uh, 9th and Romana, which is included in this government street area that we were talking about. I mean, I just want to know if that was accurate because you identified only one piece of property that you owned at 200 East Government Street. So either the tax assessor is wrong or... No, I know you're aware of what properties I'm owning and we've had other discussions. Um, at that point, I thought the context was those of us that had ownership on East Government Street, and certainly that deletion was not um, in any way meant to diminish my involvement and um, participation as a taxpayer in the CRA. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Ms. Myers. Um. I hate for this issue just to go on and on. Um, and um, I'm concerned about, um, well, for one thing, it, it seems like it's the consensus of the council that we don't want, want a survey. We don't, because that was one of the things that Mr. Gray was proposing. And um, I would not be in favor of that. But I, I do find it really and truly amazing that we, we're here discussing uh, this issue. We've spent, had four workshops on it, and yet we have people who've been begging, pleading for the city to do something about dangerous streets like Burgess Road and the traffic calming on Langley. <coughs> and, and, and the citizens did not have not been begging the city council to do anything uh, on this uh, government street issue. And yet we have spent 18, over $18,000. We've had two workshops. We've had this long hearing tonight. And you're proposing that, you know, we just, we just keep it going. Uh, I, government Street does need to be improved. It is in serious violations of uh, the ADA. I mean, there's sidewalks that are not accessible even for people who don't have disabilities. There are curb cuts that don't exist. There are plants growing where curb cuts should be. So Government Street, East Government Street, needs to be addressed. And I don't want to lose sight of of, of this, that we have got to do something about East Government Street. Um, now, another thing that we need to take into consideration, even if this were a good idea, it's a bad idea at this time, and I'll tell you why. I think it's premature because um, 
we're looking at what UWF is wanting to do with the cultural tourism. So to me, uh, talking about opening Government Street at this time is, 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 is not a good idea because it's just kind of uh, doing a hodgepodge, uh, dealing with this over here and not looking at the whole picture of what's going to happen potentially with the uh, cultural tourism, uh, which could be a real game changer. Uh, but I don't want to let go of the uh, momentum we have in terms of doing something about the sidewalks and the walkability on Government Street has to be addressed. And uh, so I'm looking at um, Mr. Gray's second recommendation here that could be modified somewhat. He says, make some pedestrian improvements to the street, but do not restore the connection of East Government Street to Ninth Avenue or Bayfront Parkway. The creation of a pedestrian gateway in the middle of the terminus of East Government seemed to have the support of the group during the series of meetings. Um, so I guess why, where I'm going is I, I would like to see some improvements to East Government Street okay. uh, without addressing the issue of opening up, it up for vehicular traffic at this time. Here, here's what I'd like for you to consider is work through Mr. Reynolds will work for a specific recommendation for the second meeting in September. And I, what I would like for you to do is, um, in that, is take some of Mr. Gray's suggestions for East Government Street, and the mayor's office can phrase it any way they, they, they want, is to um, open Government Street with the things that you wanted to incorporate from Mr. Gray's, and that will at least allow us to debate it. Right now, we don't even have a motion on the floor to debate this. Yeah, so we'll have something to debate, and once we get a hold of it at that second meeting, then we can amend it, modify it, you know, um, but we, before we go on with this any further, we need to have the specific recommendation that we can put our arms around. Okay, I'm, I, and I guess you, I'm... And I'd ask you to be in charge of that, Ms. Uh, Myers. Well, another thing, real quick, and I know we're late, is don't forget we've got our complete street subcommittee that's meeting. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, I was kind of disappointed that we weren't looking at a bigger picture in terms of restoring the grid. And so, I mean, that that's another thing we need to take into consideration. I, it's, I mean, we need a comprehensive plan, not just here, there, here, there. So, okay, I'll get with Mr. Reynolds, and um, if that's what you want me to do, to do, if that's what the council wants okay. me to do. You, you guys can, but just remember we're not debating. Sure. Okay. Okay. It, there was a, uh, uh, there is a lady in the front row on the left side that appeared to want to speak earlier. And somehow, I think you got interrupted on your way to the microphone. Okay. And my question is, do you still like to address this? I would like to say just one thing. You certainly just you feel need to free. Come to the mic, though, yes. Feel free. I, I noticed you got up and never got there. Well, I have to sit forward and as close as I can because even with hearing assistance, I have a congenital hearing problem. Sure. I still can't hear. I could not hear this gentleman. I could not hear you. I can hear you just fine. I cannot hear you. I can hear you, Dr. Wu. I can hear him. I can hear him, but I can't hear her. And the reason is because we have this wonderful technology around your desk that you won't speak in. You're speaking way back here, and you can't hear anything if you're sitting out here. So first of all, I want to ask you to use the technology that we as taxpayers have put in front of you so we can all hear. Now, when I go online, I can hear every word everybody says because it's different when you do that. So that's just something I wish you would respect people who have hearing disabilities in your audience. This is what I want to say and a question I want to leave you with. My name's Camille Barr, by the way, and I live downtown on Crown Cove right at the end of Government Street facing the Bayfront Parkway. 
first night that I came to this, to this hall for a hearing, it was because I heard by way of the grapevine and in my neighborhood that there was going to be a meeting and that at that meeting, the contract was going to be let to open Government Street. When I got to that meeting, Ms. Myers was the first one that said, we don't know anything about this. Nobody's given us anything about opening Government Street. Am I correct? Yes, ma'am. I think that's what you said. With all due respect to Mr. Mitchell, who is a, he's a community member that I've respected and he doesn't even know me, this was not an issue on two sides until the contract was going to be let and the, uh, and the government street was going to be open. So it never has been a we or a they. It was like we all showed up in mass to try to stop that from happening, the letting of that contract to open government street. So it's just since that happened that this has become a we and a they. And that's what I want you to think about. We didn't know about it. Okay, thank, thank you, you ma'am. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, thank you. And I, I, did, I just wanted to say, uh, I don't think, uh, I'm not prepared to vote on this tonight. Um, I think that uh, I would look for a recommendation from the mayor's office. I'd like to see a, a, a recommendation from the mayor, the mayor's office on what his recommendation is as we move forward. And then we can debate it at that time. And uh, I would encourage all to, uh, to come and, uh, um, voice your opinion at that time, but I, I'm not prepared to vote on this tonight. Um, I, I still uh, want to do a little more research on this, and I want to hear from the mayor. The may, maybe the mayor come down himself and, and uh, tell us what he'd like to do, and uh, and we can debate it at that time. And and in, in, in the uh, in the spirit of full full disclosure, too, I'd like to say that I do enjoy a beverage at uh, Seville Quarter um, <laughs> occasionally. So um, I know I'll probably get chastised by one of our. Council members, that's not here, but uh, in the in the spirit of full uh, disclosure, I want to say that I do enjoy beverage at Seville Quarter. Thank you. Before I move on to, I'd the, like the, to say one more thing, the mayor is the one that wants the street open. He has already told everyone on on television that he wants it open. If you go back to the mayor and ask his opinion, he's going to say he wants it open, and that is not solving the problem ma'am and for, i'm for, sorry for, but for, I had, for, for, you can for, throw me out and that's no fine. i'm not going to throw you out i just want to let you know that he when he comes back with the recommendation then we can actually debate it we can vote it up or vote it down we can't take the vote tonight without out the motion okay. and 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 to the general lady that spoke uh um, um, before about not being able to hear me. There are many in this room I could point out to you that wish they could not hear me. So, <laughs> okay. okay. Mr. Spencer. Um, thank you. I'll make it brief. I, I want to compliment some individuals this evening before we part. Okay. I, want to, I want to thank Mr. Gray for the public apology that he issued to Ms. Mack. I don't know, Diane, if she's left, but um, Mr. Mathis, is she close by? But not only, not only did um, Ms. Mack, not only did he apologize, but I think he, he delivered a sincere compliment in that he shared her, um, basically with, reminded people that weren't there that she was capable of of delivering quite a um, obviously an effective speech and so mr. gray um, thank you for living up to the basically the standard the code of ethics that I had shared publicly that that um, I know that you do uphold I also want to thank the people that in district 6 that supported me for being respectful and maintaining their decorum, their and um, their approachability, and continuing to recognize that this is not a difficult seat, and this this is a difficult seat to occupy. And I just want to share my appreciation for those of you that um, we may not always be completely aligned, but thank you for still respecting me. Finally, and most importantly, I think Councilwoman Myers will be a very effective, earnest advocate for 
restoring East Government Street to a level that uh, can be greatly enhanced for pedestrian and and other transportation um, bicycle use. I think the uh, the audience members have heard loud and clear those in the workshop that we recognize there are some fundamental building blocks that must occur on that street separate and independent of vehicular access that will begin the process of making East Government Street a model street that we can use um, throughout the district and throughout the city. Um, and then finally, I do support suspending any action on this. I am curious about University of West Florida's perspective on, on this. I am on, um, I've attended several of their meetings, their committee meetings regarding the, um, basically the, the repurposing, or I should say, um, celebrating our district and turning it into a, a magnet um, nationwide for tourism. And I, I think we, we need to hear from them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mr. President, I, I support what you have asked us to do, and I think that uh, nominating Councilwoman Myers is a, a very good choice. Can I count on you to reach out to UWF then? If, if I, if, yes, if, if you would like me to. Sure, thank right. you. Okay, uh, I'd just like for you to be the last gentleman to wrap this up for us, sir. I see no reason for you people to kick this ball down the road. I think it should be voted on tonight. Um, this putting it off and putting it off and putting it off is getting a little ridiculous. The way it's going now, it'll be next year, and you'll still be putting it off until some people get the votes they want or the petitions they want. You've heard from enough people. Decide. That's what you're paid for. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Now, this is going to be a very telling um, moment here, um, um, guys. Is, as you know, I, I've kept this somewhat... Um, private. There's a couple of you here on council that, that are aware of it. Um, but I didn't want to let it out before my campaign ended abruptly uh, last, last week. Um, the, uh, and congratulations to Mr. Bear. He's, he's, he's sitting out there. Um, I am in a state now where I am not able to perform um, at 100 percent all the time. There are some days that are better than others. Today, has been a particularly um, um, bad day. And that was the reason I had to call in uh, um, late. The fatigue just got to be so bad that, uh, uh, quite frankly, I had to take a nap before I could come down here. And uh, I'm starting to, to, to wear down now, and I'm just going to beg your forgiveness and, uh, um, and I'm, as I depart. So good luck. And uh, Mr. Reynolds, uh, I'm sure we'll back brief me on this. Okay, thank you. You got it? Yeah, you got No, you just you just move on just down the agenda. One thing that Larry wanted was to move this hour this number twelve up. Did you see did you see some of these people Oh but before before I um <coughs> walk out of here, uh, Mr. Johnson had asked that we move number twelve on the um, alcoholic beverage operation up. Um a gentleman's been sitting out here patiently and uh, um, also, num the number 12 is next. And the... Um, Without objection from council. Right. And the code enforcement has a citizen who's been here. I think she's still here. She's number, still here. Number 10. Oh. Number 10 is, also has a citizen who's been waiting. Okay. She's given me dirty looks a few times. Oh, okay. You, you want to just go ahead and dispose of that now? I think that's going to be pretty easy. Sure. Okay. Why don't you read number 6 out for us, Dr. Pratt? Um, or Mr. I'm, Reynolds, I'm sorry. Yeah, don't, don't uh, I, I'm confused. Number six, please. 
Number 10. Oh, are we going to go through six? Is it, uh, oh, I'm, never mind. I'm leaving. <laughs> All right. Sam. Hope you feel better. Okay. Hope you I think he meant to read number 10, the code enforcement 10. one. Okay. Okay, I guess you're going to be next after this one. Sorry. I told them they'd be next. We'll cook your eggs. Sorry, sorry. Good morning. Sorry. I, I, didn't. I apologize for the delay. I believe the next item in front of us, if I understand it correctly, is item number 10, I believe. 10. 10. And that is the Code Enforcement Authority request for lien reduction. And at this point, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Allen. Thank you, Mr. Acting President. Uh, the subject is Code Enforcement Authority request for lien reduction, 1449 East Burgess Road, case number 10-TAC-096. The recommendation is the City Council approve a recommendation from the special magistrate to reduce the recorded lien against the property located at 1449 East Burgess Road and authorize the mayor to execute the appropriate documents. Move the approval. Second. Okay, we move to second. Uh, discussion among council. One, two, three, four, five. We got five. We're okay. Barely. Call life support. Okay, any discussion among council? Any discussion in the uh, uh, audience? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, passes unanimous. Now we are on item number, I believe, 12. Yes, discussion. Right. Discussion item. Uh, all right. Uh, the, the hours of operation for selling uh, business, selling alcoholic uh, beverages, and uh, we will now have a discussion on that topic. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, as Ms. Morris sits down here, uh, staff has been working on this issue since it was brought to our attention. And uh, as part of it, we, we actually are coming here to get some guidance from you. Uh, we essentially have three, essentially three ideas that we're toying with, or I shouldn't say toying, three ideas that we're looking at to address this issue. But um, we don't want to go down the road and bring anything further until we get your general thoughts on it so then we can incorporate that. Uh, and with that being said, Ms. Morris, if you can kind of outline those three areas for council, and then, then I would ask uh, that council, if you could give us a vote on what generally the type of scenario is that you would like us to, to then bring something forward on for a vote, staff will then move that forward. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds, uh, members of council. Um, currently, uh, Section 742 of the City Code regulates hours of operation for businesses uh, that are selling and serving alcoholic beverages. Um, the current language in the code allows for uh, alcoholic beverages to be sold Monday through Saturday between the hours of 7 a.m. and 3 a.m. and on Sunday between the hours of 11 a.m. and 3 a.m. the following day. Um, restaurants are allowed to be open um, during the prohibited hours but not serve alcohol. Um, if the intent is to change uh, the provision in the code that restricts Sunday sales to a different, or to, uh, that if it's to amend the section that restricts Sunday sales to a different standard than the remaining days of the week. Uh, the three options that uh, would be available for you to consider would be either to, uh, to make it uniform across the board for all businesses that serve and sell alcohol, uh, to be able to serve between the hours of 7 a.m. and 3 a.m. seven days a week. Uh, you could uh, change the provision to allow restaurants only to be exempt from that Sunday restriction, uh, where s restaurants would be allowed to serve from 7 a.m. to 3 a.m. seven days a week, but not bars and, and um, uh, package stores, things of that nature. Um, or uh, as the wording currently exists in the code, it kind of lumps um, restaurants and grocery stores into the same category. Um, and you could also choose to uh, maintain that wording and allow restaurants and grocery stores to serve uh, and sell alcohol seven days a week between the hours of seven and three. So um, it really is a matter of if you want to change the code at all, how restrictive do you want to be? Uh, do you want to limit sale and service to certain types of uh, uses? Or do you want it to be an across the board um, hours of operation? Okay. Yes, Councilman. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Wu. Um, I see Mr. and Mrs. Biggers here uh, 
uh, in the front row here, and they're the one that actually brought this issue forward. And um, I support um, changing uh, that law. Um, right now, we have uh, we have uh, the Mr. Big, Mr. and Mrs. Biggers are losing business there. Um, that uh, actually driving across the bridge and going to other establishments in a, another community, another county, that uh, that allow. Um, these adult beverage sales. I, I would actually be in favor of, of number two um, to where we uh, allow uh, restaurants. Um, I use the term full service and I, my attorney told me that's probably not a good term. Whatever the legal term is to allow restaurants that uh, serve um, to allow them to go to the 7 a.m. I think at uh, the county, Escambia County that we live in, um, I think at Perdido and on Pensacola Beach they allow um, adult beverages sold um, at restaurants. It's either at 7 or 8 a.m. It's 7. Uh, 7 a.m. So I think that we're mirroring that. Um, we're um, giving this uh, business an opportunity to, uh, to continue to pay uh, tax revenues to, to, to us and to uh, allow uh, folks to be employed. And uh, they brought this issue forward. And uh, I'd like to see us at least move with the option B. Um, I'm not uh, for uh, the grocery stores at this time. I haven't had any grocery stores come to me and tell me that they're having an issue, but I have had business owners. So my, my, my preference would be number two um, that you mentioned. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councilman. Thank you, Mr. President or mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Um, I was just wondering um, if uh, the San Rosa County and Escambia County were both brought up. What? What are their regulations? Um, Escambia County, uh, their regulations are uh, that you can serve Monday through Saturday between the hours of 6 a.m. and 2.30 a.m. Um, and on Sunday, uh, the majority of the county um, is from 1 p.m. to 2.30 a.m. However, Perdido Key and Pensacola Beach are treated differently under their ordinance. And um, on um, Sundays, they can also sell between 7 a.m. and 2.30. So there's, um, on the beach and on Perdido Key, it's uniform seven days a week, 7 to 2.30. And I don't have Santa Rosa County's information, but I could get it prior to Thursday. If, you're interested. if we're in the county and we change this, does, does, the, does our law trump the county's law? We have a separate ordinance, um, and, and I did okay. check with the state um, regulating agency, and they said it's all, it's local rule with these types of laws, okay. uh, so they don't have any interest in, in whether or not we change our hours of operation. Okay. And, and I, I, I'm open to, um, to allowing the restaurants to serve um, in the morning. I, I think blue laws have had their day, but I also, you know, if we're looking at it, I, you know, it's been a long time since I've managed to get to a grocery store early in the morning, but I remember the big signs saying, you know, can't buy this right now. And it's a hassle for the grocery stores. And I just, I don't know that it, it stops people from drinking. And I, I don't imagine that we have many package stores that open at 7 a.m. on Saturday to try to get the big rush on Saturday mornings. <laughs> Or, well, they can't be open on Sunday, but we could say, well, maybe on Saturday, you know, they would be open at 7 a.m. And I, I don't imagine that it's a huge, compelling problem. So I'm open to, um, you know, removing the regulation across the board or uh, either way, if the will of the council. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Council Myers. Uh, I really don't understand the purpose of these blue laws. So what is the purpose of them? I um, mean, looking at the history of them, I, I think they they used to be they used to be far more restrictive as to the types of behavior they regulated. Um, a lot of states have done away with them entirely. Uh, they they used to get um, as specific as how people dressed and the level of activity they could have on a Sunday. Um, well, and I think they the alcohol sales are pretty much one of the last remaining holdovers. I just think that um, that that they're really antiquated. I see no purpose that they serve other than to inconvenience people. If people want to drink on Sunday morning, they'll just buy their liquor <laughs> the night before. <laughs> you know, you know. I mean, you know, they'll keep their wine cabinets and their liquor cabinets stocked. I mean, uh, I just don't don't see why uh, that they serve really no purpose except to inconvenience people and. I would be in favor of uh, doing away with them across the board, uh, but uh, 
I will wait to hear from other people and wait for somebody to, to make a motion and see if I can support it. But I'm, I'm very comfortable with uh, doing away with them across the board. Thank you, Dr. Wu, Mr. Chairman. Um, I support the request of this restaurant for sure, and I, I too think the um, blue laws are quite outdated. Um, my only concern is that, you know, and I know there'll be notice of what we've done today and that someone could come by Thursday, but that for some in our community, this is a big issue, um, and that um, if we properly notice it as an action item with a recommendation, agenda item that they have a week to research and respond to, um, you know, there may not be anyone that's that's upset about it. I haven't heard from anyone based on it being a discussion item, and I probably won't. But I would just feel better as a council that we properly noticed it as an action item with a recommendation for the citizens to understand. Um, I don't know if that hurts uh, to have to wait. It, we're back on our regular schedule. It's every two weeks. Can, so. uh, well, I th I, and I think that's a good, good I idea, too, that uh, uh, to make it an action item. So, um, I'll make a motion that uh, we uh, have this as an action item for the next uh, Committee of the Whole. Okay, second. Uh, I'll, I'll I'm sorry, okay. Councilman Pratt. Just so that we can get clarification that I understood okay. that that was what we were, we were going to say on the next Committee of the Whole or in, in two, you know, two, we were going to have either yes. don't do anything, open it for restaurants, or open it across the board, and that's what we're giving them direction. They want to hear yes. what, which, okay. which okay. of okay. options, it's not final we action. Want. Okay. So, so I I'll withdraw my second now. Okay, I good. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and I was just concerned because sure. all there was was verbal. There was nothing, and nothing for right. me to read or prepare yeah, for. And I'm I'm here at the meeting. So. Yes. Well, I, I think <laughs> your, your your comments are, are very well taken. I think any issue of major importance is awfully difficult to bring it and then immediately vote on it mm -hmm. without allowing public input, regardless of what the issue is. And mm -hmm. And I'm not speaking for or against, but I, I think that you know, it's important to do that. So I think your, your comments will okay. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. And, and, and to be clear, that's exactly what we are attempting to do here. We sir. didn't want to bring right. uh, that's something. That's why it's a discussion item. Uh, exactly. <laughs> right. We didn't want to just spring something on you, and then you say, well, no, that's not really what we were intending. So exactly. support. What we, we, we need, it, it would be good to have some clarity as to what the council wants on those three types, then we will bring that language before you for you have the opportunity then to actually see some language and, and then make a decision at that right, point council. as an action item. Right. Thank you, sir. So uh, I will make a motion that we ask the administration to prepare an action item that would eliminate um, or go to 7 to 7 a.m. to 3 a.m. for all alcohol selling entities. So eliminate the blue laws. Second. Okay. okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Morris. Thank you. Okay. Now, I'm a former statistics teacher, but the numbers have got me all the bubble here. Because we, I believe that we are now under item number six. Is that right, Madam Clerk? Four. Four. <laughs> four. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, no, that's right, number four. Okay. Uh, council action on item number four. Bear with me a minute. Oh, are you sure that's not six? Um, four was made number eleven. It was moved way yeah, down. Four so way down. let's, let's I think we're home. look at look at the six digits back there. Yeah. <laughs> let's go six. six. We have a vote for six from the audience. <laughs> oh look! I, I feel like it's the Olympics. <laughs> The yeah, city attorney very wisely offered me his notebook, which is printed right at the beginning. Uh, I will accept that generous offer. With my iPad, what I'm doing is having to go back and forth between sections and then the agenda back to the item. 
and I'm not doing it very rapidly. All right, item number six. So, why are we skipping over number four? We had moved that to eleven. Moved to number that eleven. Way the staff who've been oh, sitting here okay. patiently, okay. at least they'll get to, I don't know, know make it home six. before bedtime. Mm -hmm. Number so six. Close before we get done. Yeah, so that's four. Six, seven, eight, nine. No, no, We're actually to the mayor's stuff if Mr. Reynolds. Right? Yeah. Is this the confirmation of the mayoral? Yeah, yes. that's where we're at. Right. Number six is uh, recommendation city council confirm the appointment of Marcus Brian Cooper as the neighborhood services director. Thank you, Mr. Acting President. Uh, the subject is confirmation of mayoral appointment of, appointment of Neighborhood Services Director. The recommendation is that City Council confirm the appointment of Marcus Brian Cooper as Neighborhood Services Director. Okay. Move the approval. I'm sorry. Is that move the approval? Okay, we have move for approval. We have a second. Second. Okay, we have approval and second. Discussion. Madam. Thank you, Dr. Wu. And um, first, I'd like to say before I start talking, because I think sometimes when I talk, there's a few people that go, la, 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 they just don't want to hear it. <laughs> um, I support this, um, this uh, recommendation today, and I, I really, it's, it's only a symbolic one, and I'll, I'll say why. Um, I am so pleased to finally have an opportunity as a council to confirm directors. Um, I know that's what was intended by the Charter, and I'm so pleased. Um, and the reason I say symbolically is because I'm a bit concerned about the information that was brought to Council. I have to back up for a second and say how much I protected Council as far as having an executive summary. And when I was helping and working with the Mayor, helping to develop the agenda, I made sure of that. And I felt that possibly because this hasn't happened yet, we're so far into the new form of government, that we need a policy in place or maybe just a standing request, but that the basic information of how this decision was made needs to be given to council, that we don't have to chase it down, that we don't have to ask the questions. Um, like the, the um, award of bid that we'll be considering in a minute, by practice, we have the bid tabulation and the vendor list, and we have all the information we need to understand the why of the mayor's request. So I sent an email and I actually had Ms. Kuchera asked her um, to be able to print this and share it with you because I felt it important to be able to support a request and recommendation from the mayor to know the job description certainly is very important, um, the critical skills that are identified and needed for managing the director position that um, is being offered, um, also knowing the applicants, understanding who the applicants were, um, and then identify the screening team and the applicants and have more information basically so we can intelligently support the request from the mayor. So I've asked that that be put in front of you. I know that we don't have a great deal of time. Um, we're all very tired. Uh, but I just wanted you to have that and I would ask, I don't know if we can just have a standing request that that be part of um, the discussion when a director is being considered. Uh, it might be better to have a policy so that the next council and the next council and the next mayor um, can, can have that information in front of them. Right. Um, you know, I, with that said, I do have a few questions. Um, I had requested the list of uh, responding applicants and there was 55 and I just did a cursory um, inspection of that real quick um, and it appeared and I'm not sure why some of them are on here because I think one's actually retired but that there were applicants from within our organization and um, there was nothing in the summary given as to consideration of their expertise and their skills their time with the city um, and their ability to do this um, if that was even a part of the discussion I've seen several things that we have as standard requirements of the job and the job description itself. So um, without belaboring the point, because I do support this tonight, I would just like to hear the explanation on that, if that was a consideration or not. Are you proposing any particular action at this time? No, I'm not opposing. I, I, I will be no, supporting no, I mean, it. I'm just asking right. what what was in that process. How was the screening process? Was consideration sure. given to promoting from within? Okay. The organi our organization, so the city. My question is, are, are you asking for a response immediately yes. or, or are you? 
just, I mean, yes, yes. to understand it. Just, Certainly, yes, Mr. That Rouse. would be my final concern sure. to okay. be able to Thank you. support Thank it. You. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Rouse. Acting President. Uh, uh, the final eight applicants, four were internal and four were external. The, the four that were internal uh, included uh, uh, at least one individual that was a, a former employee. So uh, as with any other position, uh, you know, we're going to take a look at, at, at the excellent quality of, of internal candidates that we have. And, uh, uh, you know, that's just going to be a matter of course. Okay, anybody else? Is, is that okay, Councilman Myers? Yes, I do have some questions. Is the neighborhood services a department? The charter says that the city council has the authority to approve or confirm um, department heads. Is that what the charter says? Councilwoman Myers, that's why this appointment is coming before you, is to, to approve the appointment of the Director of Neighborhood Services. Okay, is that a department? Is Neighborhood Services a department within the meaning of the Charter? Yes, ma'am. That's why the pick is coming before you. Okay. So, Neighborhood Services is a department, and who... What all does this neighborhood services encompass? Does that also encompass uh, housing? No, ma'am. Okay, so the, the Pensacola News Journal was incorrect when it said that uh, this uh, neighborhood services position encompasses parks and recreation, the library, <coughs> and housing. It does not encompass housing. Okay. Um, and are there any divisions under this uh, neighborhood services uh, department? The divisions you have are library. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, that's the only other division under neighborhood services. And so neighborhood services encompasses park facilities and recreation and the library. That's correct. And that's what David Flaherty was doing. David Flaherty was doing everything but the library. The library will be incorporated in this next budget cycle. Okay. All right. Thank but you. But we wanted to make clear that, you know, this position will ultimately have uh, an oversight role in regards to the library. That's why that information was included. Okay, is, is housing a department? What, what department does housing fall under? Or is it a department? Well, uh, Councilwoman, uh, what, what, uh, what, uh, what? Let, let me stop here for a moment. I believe that the issue at hand is the confirmation of a neighborhood services director. Uh, I certainly don't want to limit discussion but I want to make certain that the line of questioning. I'll withdraw the que questioning. Okay. Because and and I, I, he's already please said forgive me. I'm not trying to be uh, obstinate. I'm just trying to keep us on task. Okay. Um, I'll withdraw that line of questioning and ask that question later. And, and certainly I have no objection if you do so. Because he said, yeah, he said I, it I doesn't no include objection. housing. Okay. Uh, not, but not at this time. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion? Yes, Councilwoman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to first welcome Mr. Cooper to um, the fun adventure of city government um, in you. Pensacola. Um, uh, we, uh, I've talked to various people. We were all amazed that you, this is a trial by fire, though this isn't unusual for us. Um, anyway, um, I just wanted to say that um, based on his resume, it looks like he's got a lot of experience, and he, he mentioned um, that libraries aren't part of his experience, but I'm sure he'll be able to learn that. But I, I am a big fan of the libraries. I was actually at the library on my way here today, and, and I do hope that you will put a lot of good effort into uh, learning our library system. It's a, it's a bizarre um, 
recreation with the county and all of that. So it'll it'll definitely um, give you quite a challenge. But um, I do look forward to um, hearing from you as we get further along. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilwoman. Anybody else on council? Anybody in the audience? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Not me. No, no. Okay. Uh, Two, three, four, five, five yeses and one no. Yes, yes. There would be five yeah. yeses and one no. All right. <clears throat> Moving on to item seven. Recommendation City Council adopt a supplemental budget resolution <coughs> amending the Port's fiscal year 2012 budget to provide funding for capital improvement. Move the approval. Second. Moved and second. Uh, discussion on council. Okay. Anybody in the audience? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay, moving on to item number eight. Recommendation City Council award a contract to Ken Griffin Landscape Contractors incorporated the lowest and most responsible bid in amount of two hundred and sixteen thousand six hundred and seventy one thousand and sixty nine cents for the construction of the Pensacola International Airport Army Reserve Center parking lot, landscaping and irrigation project, plus a ten percent contingent and a one-year maintenance fee of $24,910.48. What is your pleasure? Move the approval. Second. Okay. Moved and second. All right. Discussion among council. Audience, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Moving along now to item nine. Item number nine. Mr. President, I can I can uh, take that if you wish. Okay, give us one second so we'll be proper. Recommendation: City Council approved the state grant aid agreement 2012-2013. Thank you, Mr. Move Reynolds. the approval. Mr. Reynolds. Second. Okay. Do we have a motion. Mm -hmm. No second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. And item number four, which will end us up. There's five. So hopefully Up this is four. Recommendation City Council approve an ordinance creating section 12136 of the Code of City of Pensacola to ensure minority. Non minority representation and balance on boards, authorities, and commissions. What's your approval? What's your pleasure? Move to approve. Okay, we have second. Second. Okay, discussion? Nope. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I did not ask if there was any discussion for the audience. Oh, yes, Councilwoman. Sorry. I just wanted to speak on this briefly. Uh, this is an impossible thing to vote against, but I, um, in my heart, it doesn't work. Um, I just, it's 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 lip service. It doesn't hold us to anything, and it's it's one of those things that that I've encountered as a female, is particularly in science, the the sense that did I get my position for whatever it was based on gender or not, and that that has always bothered me in in certain situations and so can't vote against it because it's motherhood and apple pie but i i think that it's um you know it it doesn't 
hold us to anything. It doesn't do anything, but it does make people question um, how we decide who's on our boards. But um, and I, I think that this council has been very good about trying to bring a diversity of people to to be nominated and have been making good progress. Um, so. I don't know that it's necessary to have this, but um, I'll vote for it um, just with reservations. Thank, Thank you very much. Mr. Okay. Uh, count, uh, yes, Chair, Councilwoman. Chairman, I would just like to remind Council how this came about. You've already voted to uh, put similar language in an ordinance revising our Park uh, and Recreation Ordinance Board. and. Uh, so we, we did that and we said when we took that action, we were going to make it applicable for all of our boards and not just our Parks and Recreation Board. If you recall, we amended our Park and Recreation Board to put this language in there. And I made the motion that we do it consistently for all of our boards. So this is why we have this before us tonight so that it will apply to all of our boards, not just Parks and Recreation Board. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Any other discussion, Council? Audience? I don't know if we have a quorum, do we? Let's see. Do Larry we just we stepped okay. down. Yes, all in do. favor? Five. Aye. Aye. Opposed? I, um, I no. <laughs> Can you no, say anyway? <laughs> <laughs> you were for it, right? I'm for it. Yes. yes. All right. Let's yes. redo that just to double check. Those in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> so we have four in favor. Opposed? So your vote tucked away. Did it fail? Yeah. Yeah. So we had we for parks and recreation. Does we have diversity requirement. Fail. Huh? Was no, wait, four. It doesn't fail. In committee. It did. Oh, the council needs. We have still goes to council. Yeah, the majority still goes to council. Okay. Councilman yeah. Johnson. It's a vote of presence, yes, and it's enough. It's okay. It's, we're okay. It's fine. You get to make this we speech again. Yeah. No, we're fine. We're Rowan. Fine. We're fine. Rowan. Um, any other business to come before council? No. Uh, New I business. Yes, sir. Um, I just I know it's late, but I just want to share with everyone an, an, an issue regarding abandoned structures um, and police or criminal activity that may be associated with it. And as I understand, we have administration that is working on that um, on that issue. But there are there are. <laughs> I know that Ms. Mack's listening to me. Anyway, <laughs> there, there are structures in neighborhoods that many council members just may not get a chance to visit um, that truly are inviting and creating um, crime. And these residents are, are greatly affected. And uh, one particular structure on F and Cervantes, West Cervantes, is being under heavy constant surveillance as I understand and will be a property that may we may be able to have an um, through an expedited process as a council need to take some action on um, prior to having um, basically entered into a contractual uh, relationship with council with legal counsel am I right um, so anyway mr. acting chair right, right. Yes, Ms. Reynolds. Thank you, sir. And if I can just uh, just briefly uh, kind of outline where we're going with this is that there are multiple structures that are in the city that haven't had the attention from the city that they need in regards to whether they're burned out, whether they're dilapidated and falling in. And this goes back to the mayor's emphasis on code enforcement uh, when he first came into office. And as we continue down this road, we are going to start taking action against these properties. Uh, we, we are going to uh, acquire them if necessary, uh, and then we are going to take these structures down. They, they, they bring down the quality of life to the neighborhoods, 
Uh, and, uh, you know, we have a responsibility to do that and are in the process of putting together the plan of action as, uh, as Councilman Spencer noted, and uh, you will see that in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the cl Madam Clerk has informed me that we also need to approve the consent item agendas. That would, <clears throat> excuse me, be items number one, two, three, five, ten, seven, eight, and nine. Move the approval. Okay. Uh, those in favor? Aye. Aye. One Aye. last thing before I gavel this uh, to an end. Uh, I will not be here Thursday because I will be at the Florida League of Cities. But um, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to worry. John Geralds will be sitting in the seat. Uh, oh, no, Councilman Townsend or Councilman Geralds. Anything else for the good order before we adjourn? Okay.